Hello, hello. I got my adventure hat on today. You are you guys already know what it is. Appreciate you spending your Friday evening with me. Excellent. Excellent. Audio's good. <clears throat> Be ready for a long one. We, we got to cover 390 years. Probably, probably, <clears throat> it's not the most enigmatic period because, you know, I recently covered an 817-year period before the flood leading up to the, the, the construction project we know of as the Great Pyramid of Giza. But uh, I still need to cover all the history after construction began, during the reign of the Seven Kings, and all the way through the dynasties of the Pentopolis to the Great Flood. There's a lot to cover. I haven't done that one yet. So this one I think is necessary because it bridges a lot, a lot of the things that we've discussed in archaics. Um, 390 years is a very long period of time. I'm going to demonstrate that because I'm going to be giving you guys perspective. This is what is missing from the education community. What I mean is, is it's real easy to talk about vitrified fortresses and all, and it's good. It's, it's easy to talk about mud floods and Phoenix resets. We can talk about civilizations that rise and fall, uh, diluvial cataclysms. We can talk about Hesiod's Theogony and how it's, and how it talks about a different series of cataclysms than let's say the, uh, the writings of Ovid's, Ovid's Metamorphosis. But if no one's providing you perspective, it's just a bunch of stories. You don't really, you can't really put it into a frame of reference chronologically to understand what time period is being conveyed. So this is what we need to do now, because you've got a lot of people that have no foundation to stand on, who believe ridiculous things like the great flood mentioned in the Bible is 10,000 BC. We know what it is scientifically. It's the younger Dryas. It's not, it's not the younger Dryas anything. You cannot take two unknowns and add them together and claim you have discovered anything at all. The younger, the whole younger Dryas narrative, one, is still a theory. And two, it does not chronologically fit the facts, just like the Atlantis narrative. This is why I'm never going to take get anybody to debate me on the Atlantis, because once they see my data sets, they know they're wrong. Now, can they undo all their work? No. Graham Hancock alone mentions Atlantis in, in like 11 different books and in all, over 200 podcast documentary, uh, documentaries and, and uh, presentations. He can't undo all that, so he's just going to ignore me. I'm cool with that. I get it. I understand. But we have to have perspective. Without perspective, history is meaningless. We have to understand that these stories aren't just a, a group of stories that are just somewhere in the past. There were vast distances of time between many of these events. People throw out people throw out things like, oh. Uh, uh, the destruction of Sumer and Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, and all the skeletons that were found that were radioactive, and other people will throw in all oh, the Yugas. Yeah, the Yugas described these destructions off off the uh, coast of of India. And we have off the coast of India, we've got a submerged civilization. We've got records of this going back thousands of years. And other people want to talk about the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah, and most people don't even realize you're talking about the same event. Over and over, I have presented material showing you that about 90% of all destructive megalithic strata that we have found, all the ancient cities, all, all were all laid waste by a single event. The Ogygian Deluge in 1687 BC. Five videos it took for me just to get some of the evidence out. Still don't have it all out. John and I were going through a lot more this morning just to put all my Archaics Academy stuff in there because Archaics Academy is going to overwhelm people with data. Any topic you choose in Archaics Academy, you're going to be authority in that. No one's ever going to be able to deceive you on these things again because you're going to have the data and you'll be able to educate anybody. That's just for one, that's just one category, that's just one, one class. 
Imagine if you took all 68 of them. There's nothing, nothing out there in Netscape is going to be able to deceive you. You've got all, all the data sets to put everything into perspective. That's the key here. That's what we're going to get into when I'm telling you about these events. I'm also going to tell you how many years after the Great Flood these events occurred. And I'm going to give you even more perspective by telling you what year it would have been if it would have been us. It's 2024 right now. So if an event was 300 years ago, I would tell, I'm going to tell you that this event I'm describing is so many years after the flood. But for some perspective, we're talking about an event that is exactly way after here, like 300 years. We're talking about pre-revolutionary war. The reason perspective matters is because the information that is passed down to us is passed down through the filters of culture and reset. And this is what why it becomes so primitive. This is why we don't really have a, a firm grasp of what we're of what we're actually looking into. If you think we've only been technologically advanced recently, you got another thing coming because this presentation is leading to just that. Something happened in the ancient world. They were already cognizant of Typhon. They knew, they even knew the Typhon periods. I'm going to show that. They knew of the Nemesis X object. You can call it Nibiru, whatever. They even had an idea about the dark satellite and it being and it having something to do with, with governing over major changes in our world. They, had, they understood this, but something else happened and wiped out the ancient world. And it wasn't any of these at all. It wasn't Typhon, Phoenix, it wasn't Nemesis X, and it wasn't the dark satellite. Even Zechariah Sitchin postulated that what is described in the cuneiform text, the lamentation text, what is described about Sodom and Gomorrah and the fate of Larak and Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, all the Sumerian cities, what is descri described in the Mahabharata of the star spear that burned with an intensity of 10,000 suns and people's flesh and eyes melted off their bones before their bones hit the ground? The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and all these cities was at the exact same time, and it was a shock to the ancient world. Totally, a total retardation of human development. People lost their minds, and it was 100% technologically advanced attacks. This is what happened. This is when cargo cult phenomenon, this is when cargo cult culture meets aggressive, technologically advanced culture. There's no escape. There's no survival. All you can do is hide. So this is what we're, what we're going we're gonna to be leading up into this. Yeah, Amar Udaak. You know of him as Nimrod in the Bible. We're going to be talking about him and his reign. We're going to be talking about Samiramis. We're going to be talking about the other sons of Uranus and Gaia. Yeah, most people, we don't, we don't hardly ever talk about these. But Noah... And Nama had other sons and daughters, and this caused major problems in the ancient world. Yeah, this is a this is a huge, huge uh, opening of the understanding of why the there was a major war. I'm talking about all these normal sized humans got together and all of a sudden wanted to kill all the giants, and there's a reason for that, and it goes back to Uranus and Gaia who we know of in the biblical material as Noah and Nama. Before the cataclysm, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, which they have other names, we'll, we'll discuss them here, depends on the culture. But they were titans too, because they were born during the vapor canopy period. But when the vapor canopy collapsed and the sky fell, it was really noticeable after that within the first generation that there was some problems. I'm even going to introduce you to the to a ruler of Sumer early after the cataclysm who had to legislate and, and literally create new laws to protect ordinary size humans from being bullied in the markets and in commerce from the Lugalum. 
you've seen pictures of the Lugalum. If you've been online looking up Sumerian stuff, they show the Lugals. You can call them Lugalum, which is Sumerian plural, or you can just call them Lugals. But like the like the hunter Lugal Banda. Lugal means giant man. It can also mean very big man. But we've seen pictures on Sumerian reliefs. You've seen them. You've seen those big guys wearing the little skirts, huge round eyes, like Asiatic artists always depict white people with big round eyes. And they got beards and they're huge. And even when they sit down, they're way bigger than the, the people standing up around them. Yeah. These aren't just artistic depictions, guys. They are mentioned in the cuneiform. They're called the Lugals. The Lugals were the, the big men. And in the earliest Sumerian texts, they're referred to as uh, benefactors. They're called big brothers over and over and over. And it was only after a span of time that, that was legislation needed. They needed to pass new laws because people were intimidated by their size. And when they were in the marketplaces, it was known that the that the big brothers would get the best prices or, or, or they would be able to talk people down. And, and this became a problem with normal sized humans. Normal sized humans passed laws like the Code of Hammurabi. So we're going to be getting into that, guys. This is going to be a really exciting one. I'm, I'm anticipating it's going to be kind of long. I am. I'm going to breeze over some topics. If this is the type of stuff that really interests you, 100% of this presentation is in the updated new Chronicon. This is what we're going through. We're going through Chronicon the first 390 years after the flood. The only thing I'm adding to it is just new notes from other files John and I are going through. I'm always finding finding stuff, guys, because I'm not as organized as you think. I'm not organized until I do the presentation and it's out there. But uh, I'm off. Uh, this is the best way for me to organize my my material is just put it in a in a in an Archaics Academy format and just start giving giving dissertations. So <clears throat> we already got over a thousand people in the chat. Um, uh, May thirtieth, not May thirtieth, but March thirtieth. On the thirtieth of this month, we're doing the Houston deal. We're gonna have a blast. You guys know how we do it. Put them tables around there. Oh. Uh, uh, listen, I'm doing Q&A all day. Uh, I don't have any presentations. I'm just going to meet with the community, kick it. We might order some food. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, we'll always have coffee. Um, I'm going to bring our rotisserie so we can uh, give out free prizes. Got merchandise. Um, uh, we're giving out merchandise too, like last time. Uh, books from the 1800s. You guys know how we do it. We're going to have some fun in Houston. And uh, today... Don went ahead and paid for the venue in Tampa, Florida. I believe she told me that it's going to be in the month of May, May 11th. We scheduled it for May 11th. We had to push it back a little bit because uh, we got to make sure she's healed from surgery and all that. But yeah, but it's going down here in a couple more weeks, right, right here, right here in the Houston area. It's a, a warrior goddess. It's Northwest Houston. Somewhere in Northwest Houston. It's the same room we always use. This is like our third or fourth time going there. We like it. Real big room, comfortable bathrooms. Uh, easy to get to, large parking lot. Let's see. Um, I don't have really have very many announcements. I do have uh, something interesting. I got these. Uh, see, David Edward wrote. Atlantis found ancient civilizations, Aztec, Inca, and more. I'm going I'm to be looking at these. We, we're probably going to have a difference on, on chronology, but that's okay. I can forgive a lot of people until they see my data sets, and then and then uh, it's all right. I think he's more interested in geographical location, like the Reichshot structure. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with all that. Uh, it, it very well may be exactly where it's from. We do know that area was once called the Triton Sea. The Sahara Desert was not a desert. It was called the Triton Sea. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Arab, Bedouin Arabs used to charge tourists and they would escort them to a place way out there past Mauritania um, and, and show people a, a huge wooden galley. And the galley slaves, the rowers, were still chained to the keel. They were still chained. It's a, uh, 
so it, it must have drained out very fast under cataclysmic circumstances. Diodorus Siculus and Strabo both bo both mentioned that that whole area of North Africa was underwater. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's part of my chief evidence that Robert Schock is absolutely wrong, and the water damage that is done to the Sphinx was done rapidly, and it wasn't done over a ten thousand year period because be it wasn't done. It wasn't done by rainfall and all that. I don't can't even believe they, a geologist would come up with that. It's very obvious if you just look at the traditions. Ancient Egyptians did not call the area Gopt. Egypt until way after it was known as the raised land. Yeah, the giant dog and the two holy mountains were underwater. And it's because the North African plate had gone down. But in 2239 BC, it sank. And when it when it did, the Strait of Gibraltar broke through what is called in ancient world the Pillars of Hercules. The Pillars of Hercules that Europe and Africa they once touched, that land bridge broke free. And the pressure of the outside Atlantic came in and flooded out over 200 stone cities. Guys, the great flood of the Bible did not flood the entire world. This is Jewish redactionism. It's just not true. It flooded the entire world of a certain people who were living in that area, a whole series of freshwater lakes and valleys which was formerly known as the Mediterranean, the Aegean, the Adriatic, and the Black Sea, and the Dardanelles and all that. Every bit of that was beautiful, lush, timber-filled valleys with fresh water. And when the Straits of Gibraltar broke through, all that flooded. They didn't have a chance. I have another video that shows the megalithic damage that was done to Malta. Whole structures on Malta with 90 to 100 ton blocks where the tsunami just took those blocks and scuba divers have found them distributed, still laying on the floor. You, they can, and scuba divers have, can even see the distribution of the megaliths show how powerful the tsunami is that washed over Malta. Buried all of Malta. This is 2239 BC. And for 340 years, more than 50% of the Great Pyramids and 100% of the Sphinx was under the salt water of the Mediterranean until a series of earthquakes in 1899 BC, the 340th year after the flood, suddenly raised the North African plate back up. When the North African plate came back in 1899 BC, it drained out, creating what you know of as the Egyptian Delta, the Nine Bows area with the pyramid right there at the apex. When, it, when, the, when the Sphinx and all that water pulled back out to the Mediterranean, it left behind seashells and fossils of marine creatures, which, which have never been a secret. Over and over and over, researchers have been finding it, despite the Egyptian Antiquities Department sanitizing the area over the past 60, 70 years, destroying all evidence of, of submarine provenance. But Frederick Norton Lewis in the 1700s had already documented that the entire area was buried in seashells and fossils. I have a photo of an actual fossil that was found right there on a block of the Great Pyramid. So, um, this is what had happened. And after 340 years underneath the salt water of the Mediterranean, Anubis lost his head. There's nothing but a stump of a neck left. That's all they that's all that Pharaohs had after the flood to work with. So that's why the headdress and the tiny ass face is so dis disproportionately small on the Sphinx. The rest of the body indicates a head that would be much bigger, but they didn't have that to work with. All they had was the was the dog's neck. So they turned the neck into a face with a headdress. But even the sides of the headdress are still anatomically equal with the width of the, of the dog's neck. That's why it looks so weird. I have a video on the Sphinx that shows 360 aerial degree pictures of the Sphinx. It's, it's only when you see it like that, multiple different perspectives, that you see how ridiculously tiny the head of the Sphinx is. They hide it really good with photography. All right, I'm running my mouth. So yeah, shock is wrong. It wasn't 10,000 years of rainwater. It doesn't go back to the Younger Dryas period. Three, three centuries is a long time. 340 years underneath 
underneath the corrosive saline water of the Mediterranean is what damaged that sphinx. It's why that whole area looks so terrible. And the Great Pyramids weren't hardly damaged at all because they were covered in 100-inch thick white limestone casing blocks. Now, researchers have noticed that the water content of the Great Pyramids is unusual for it being in a desert. And it's because they were underwater for so long. But Al Biruni, a thousand years ago, mentioned that on the casing blocks before the Muslims removed them, on the casing blocks two thirds the way up was a dark brown line that showed the ancient sea level. It's not. It's not that the sea went up. the The idea that the whole world flooded in the great in, in the great flood of the Bible. This was. This is because the biblical material was written thousands of years after the events they depict. It never happened. The whole Mediterranean, Middle Earth flooded, not the whole world. Yeah, there's whole entire black cultures in sub-Saharan Africa that have no legends whatsoever of a flood. There are other areas in the Americas, no legends whatsoever of a great flood. It didn't happen everywhere. And it couldn't of the diversity, the diversity of haplotypes, gene types all around the world. There's no way the entire world flooded. And there's no way that all the diversity that we find in the human type today could have come from eight people in 2239 BC. It would have never happened. All of that was just oversimplification. And this is what we get a lot because, as I showed in my, in my, in my past presentation, everything that we receive in the historical record be it from oral traditions, be it, be it from translations of statuary, ossuaries, uh, coffin text, pyramid text, uh, uh, temple walls, it doesn't matter. Everything is recorded ex post facto. We never have events recorded when they happened. Everything, even though a lot of people don't know this, but this is easily verifiable. We don't have any Sumerian records. We don't have any. What we have are Akkadian copies that claim to be copies from Sumerian texts. What we have are Babylonian, Assyrian, and Canaanite cuneiform and Hittite cuneiform that claim to be copies of older Akkadian texts. This is what we have. So we do have references like <coughs> King Ashurbanipal, the scholar, the scholar king of Assyria. He did leave behind in his memoirs. He says, "I have." I have studied the writings from before the flood. He left, a, he left an inscription that said that. But do we really know he, he had access to that? He could, have, he could have been studying Akkadian, which is very different than the Assyrian cuneiform. So he, he, we just don't know. We just don't know. And we, but what we do know is that 100% of the Sumerian histories never happened in the Euphrates Tigris area. It's not where they happened. Not the, not the pre-flood ones, because after this massive, megalith, terrible flooding that happened, it was uh, they had to relocate. And it's when they relocated, this is where we're going to start our story here, here today. When they relocated, they found a really nice area in the Tigris Euphrates Basin. We even have references from old texts, uh, the Greek and Hesiod, especially in the book of Jasher, the rabbinical chronology of the world, it even says that Right after the flood, when people started beginning to multiply, they they went eastward and searched for an area to build a city. And when they did, they built a, a city and they called it Shinar. A lot of people have made the association that Shinar is Sumer. It very well could be, but it's a post-cataclysmic Sumer because most of the Sumerian histories happened somewhere else. The seven kings of the Anunnaki ruling over Sumerian culture, the cities of Bad Tabira and Sippar and Shurapak and Lara, these were pre-flood cities. We have never found the locations to those cities. We don't know where they're at, unless we did find them and we're calling them something else. I have postulated this as well. Because Turkey fits all the qualifiers for the histories that we find in the Sumerian text and in the book of Genesis. The Tepes and the Huyuk sites. It's not just Gobekli Tepe and it's not just Cattle Huyuk. There are multitudes of Huyuk sites and there are multitudes of Tepes. And the Tepes qualify as the Edens of the Sumerian records, the walled enclosures. Turkey also has all the underground cities. It has 59 of them to date. There's rumored to be a, 60, a 60th. The first one was discovered 
uh, uh, what is it, uh, Darren Kuyu in 1962. Now they're finding them all over the place, but these are sophisticated, sophisticated air vents and drainage and sewage. And it's amazing. These people could have survived under there for long periods of time. Turkey is now yielding the archaeology of what we find in the historical record. Only could have only unfolded in Turkey, home of the ancient Anatolian Hittite Empire. So this is a uh, this is John Levy here. John Levy and this guy, John Levy and David Edward wrote this book together. I'll be checking them out. I'll be checking them out. Hey guys, just because just because someone doesn't have all the data I have and I've presented on the chronology of Atlantis does not mean I will I will dismiss their material at all. These are not books on chronology. These are books on showing the location and establishing the veracity of the story of Atlantis. And I'm cool with that. Any re any researchers out there doing Atlantis Atlantis type of research? That's all that's all good with me. I've read a lot of books that show Atlantis in different geographical areas and they and they present their case and all that's good with me. My only points of contention are chronology and I'm so confident I'm willing to debate anybody on the dating of Atlantis. Where you find Atlantis does not concern me. So I can probably find a lot of value in these books. Now, all right. Oh, this coffee's good. I hope somebody's listening and pretty soon I get some hot coffee because this coffee here I got was, was real warm because somebody was taking a nap before. I, I won't tell you anymore before somebody gets mad. But, uh, oh, you got that book? Susie? Yeah, John Levy co-wrote the book. I thought that was pretty interesting. I have a real good book by Martin Leakey, too. He doesn't really he doesn't really promote himself enough, I don't think. But Martin Leakey wrote a fantastic book. It's a huge, it's thick. Yeah, it's a big book. All right. Let's see here. I'm probably going to need my bathroom break video again today, too, because we're going to go deep. I got some I, archaics veterans. Man, I hope I got a bunch of veterans in the chat because you are going to have some brain gasms when you hear some of this data. How 390 years after the Great Flood was packed full of all kinds of events. Oh, and guess what? Hidden, tucked just tucked into my notes as if it didn't matter where it was. I found the actual translation in Sumerian for the word shar. Couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. Just tucked in my notes. Yeah, guys, it's amazing. I, I keep going through all these files, and John's helping me organize this stuff. And, and Dawn has a friend named Lisa. She's a good typist, helping me organize all these notes, put them in it. And, and I keep finding these things like, oh, my God, I can't believe there's um, the amount of data that I recorded when I was in prison. I just put it, I didn't have time to collate a lot of this. So I was just, I was just in data recording mode. Just, just get it all down, get it all down, sit at home, get it all down, get it all down, sit at home. And it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Shocking me. All right. So I have a, uh, so on, on the 30th of this month, we're just going to get together for about nine hours and kick it in Houston. And then on uh, May, May 11th, we're going to be in Tampa, probably May, May, May 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. I know for a fact we're going to Virginia. I just don't know when. But uh, I do know that in May, uh, I have a family reunion and Dawn's going with me. Uh, I don't know why she wants to meet all those crazy people. I really don't. But oh, I'll fly in into Reno. I'll be flying into Reno with Dawn, and uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna introduce her to uh, to my family. My dad's really excited about going. It's a man. It's gonna be something. All right. So. We got 13, we got 1300 pairs of ears. So let's get this, let's get this underway.
Yeah, I'm excited about this. So, in the chronological record, we have a, we have a, we have the picture painted in the Deucalion and Pura uh, traditions. We have the picture painted that nothing was happening for a few years after the flood of Deucalion. Nothing. People were living hand to mouth. They were just trying to survive. They were in survival mode. The, the level of destruction was so critical that people were even unable to find the cities of their nativity. The, one of the core problems that people were introduced with as soon as this happened was the inability to communicate. And what I mean is, is we have all the evidence outlined that in the pre-flood world, People were technologically advanced, and they they had they used technology to communicate, not just written communications, but all all the uh, uh, verbal communications, all that. But that infrastructure was taken from them by Typhon. The Phoenix appeared and destroyed that world. That's why it's called the Antediluvian world. It's a whole period lost to history. Now I've documented a, a bunch of the history that's in that period, but still. It was, it left the survivors in shock. No, there was not just eight survivors. And no, Noah was not the only one on an ark. We had fleets of arks. And many of those arks were never found, never seen again. It probably got mud flooded, uh, liqui liquefaction, sunken to the ground in dry areas, thinking water was going to come in that area, and it didn't come. And, uh, you already know the Phoenix on, on the worst episodes. Phoenix is like a horn blast from the sky that vibrates the ground with such intensity that anything on the ground literally sinks into the ground until the noise stops. When the noise stops, everything is rendered back solid. So we have, this was one of the worst, one of the worst Phoenix episodes. So the very first event that we have is four years after the destruction. And this is in the Bible. Four years after the destruction, you still got millions of people out there. They're just, there's no cohesion. People are just surviving. I mean, we can even go negative with the cannibalism. It was bad. It was bad. Also, also, there was a, there was a, there was a lot of dying out after this period because of lack of food. Also, many people. They never regarded themselves as titanic. They didn't regard themselves as huge. But, but in the new world, they didn't have enough oxygen to breathe. And it caused a lot of problems. The, the titans were all of a sudden sluggish. They're very, they're, they moved slower. They weren't able to do, do a whole lot of activity before they were winded. And this was a pro this was a problem. It would have been the younger Titans that fared better. The, a lot of the older Titans would have just died off pretty fast. Four years later, is we we have a mentioning in the in the book of Genesis that it took four years before Noah had a successful vineyard. He's growing grapes. This this is this is in tandem with the Greek legends of Deucalion, new, he's, he's the new wine sailor, Deucalion, and his wife's name is Pyrrha, which basically means fiery red. So we have the new wine sailor, who is Noah, the sailor of the ark, and, and uh, Pyrrha, uh, fiery red, who survived the flood. And in the Greek traditions, this is where it gets interesting, because in the Greek tr traditions, they they pray to the gods, they pray pray to Zeus or who I can't remember whoever, but they get help from a goddess in the underworld who sends them the necessary components to make sure that humans on the surface world can thrive. This is in the Greek traditions. So of these components, they get these stones, and they're given specific instructions to to throw stones behind them. Don't look back. Just throw stone, stones behind them to bring a new race of people up. And this is what happened. Deucalion and Pyrrha 
walked around and threw stones over their shoulder and people, people sprouted up out of the ground and they considered Deucalion and Pura their leaders. They're not the only Greek tradition that talks about a benefactor, a, a civilization bringer after a, a flood, after the Ogygian flood, the Peloponnesus was uninhabitable for 189 years. This is in the Greek traditions. That's a very specific number. The Ogygian deluge was 1687 BC, and in the 189th year, a foreigner from Egypt came and brought his people, and his name was Cecrops. And Cecrops, who built Athens and all that, Cecrops specifically threw stones when he was fighting the Laomedian, the Laomedian, I can't even pronounce it. It's the ancient name of the Spartans, uh, Lacedaemonians. When he was fighting the, Lac the Lacedaemonians, it seemed like every time that his people would kill a bunch of them, a bunch more would appear. So he, he too, uh, prayed to the gods and was given a procedure and that procedure was to throw stones and when he threw those stones warriors popped up in place of those that had fallen so we have these strange greek traditions now i'm telling you now no one threw stones and the component the components were not were not were not we're not something is as rudimentary as as stones. What we are receiving is the transmission of something very technologically advanced, given through the filters of traditional stories that have passed through the series of multiple resets. This is what we're this is what we're we're putting back together. Remember, the underground cities are where all the underground people came from. After the reset, we have the same thing told in Phrygia of Turkey. After the great flood, the people came back up. How did they get down there? We know, we know they survived because we found 59 underground cities, starting with Derinkuyu under Turkey. These, the existence of these cities is evidence that that legend is actual history. And that legend is, is that a king who was very wise, named Anakos, knew of the coming of the destruction of the world. And he knew he had to save his people. And the only way to do it was to, was to take them underground. And they could come back up after the destruction was over. This is in Phrygia. Phrygia is Turkey. So when we put the archaeology with the traditions and we have and we and we have the chronology, everything fits in place perfectly. The Greeks support the, the Phrygian, the Phrygian and the Lydian traditions su support the Hittite. We uh, for those of you who don't know, the Hittites had a god named Teshub. Teshub was a god of thunderbolts and destruction. He was very much like the phoenix. And when he appeared, the people hid from him as well. And when it was all over, they would come back up and they would plant. And they would do all kinds of things. And it was a huge cycle. And they always forgot to honor Teshub. Because by the time the people had, had remembered Teshub again, it's too late. He's on the way back. He appears in the sky. He destroys everything. And every single time... Tesha comes back only after the people have forgotten he existed. They didn't give him honor anymore. He's the phoenix. He's the sky god. So, four years after the great flood, we have a vineyard. We have Noah, Deucalion, new wine sayer. Noah is Uranus of, of the ancient Greeks. Call him Uranus, Uranus, however you say it. Now, his wife is Gaia. Now, they are Titans, even in the Greek and Hesiod, San Cuniathan, they're Titans. This is how they are described in the traditions. They're taller, they live longer, they never grow old. This was the this was one of their chief characteristics. Now, interestingly, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but we cannot avoid the calendrics and we cannot we cannot avoid the anthropology. And what I mean is, is a lot of people want to take the Bible, they want to take the story of the flood and of Noah, and they want to apply it to the whole world as, a, as, a, as, a, as if it applied to every culture. And we have this huge equality movement, but I'm telling you now, the history did not apply to anybody but Indo-Iranian people. This isn't Jason telling you this. 
going, going, going all the way back to the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, the principal researchers like Lenormand, I tell you guys about, they, they all knew that the Indo-Iranian family of peoples were the only people in the world who had a flood story. It's a huge branch of peoples from the Hurrian, the Arartran, the, the, Ar the Aryan uh, from northern India that ended up uh, uh, inter integrating with the Dravidians of India. We're talking about the great, the Egyptians did not have a great flood tradition. Sub-Saharan Africa has no flood tradition. All flood traditions that are of non-Indo-Aryan pedigree are imports. They're imported. And this has been established over and over and over and over. It's just not popular, especially in today's academic arena. It is not even popular to talk about these things. But this is well established in the scholarly literature of a hundred years ago. And what I mean is, is that the Great Flood story only involved Middle Earth. Middle Earth was the Mediterranean, and it was no, it was no sea. It was a series of dry valleys, and we have now found over 200 stone cities beneath the water waterline of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. This was all Indo-Iranian people, the ancestors of the Greeks, the Peloponnesians, the Pelasgians, the ancestors of Argos, the ancestors of the Phoenicians, the ancestors of Urartu, Rashamra, the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, the ancestors of the Amuru, all this. When this flood happened, they weren't called Indo-Iranian. They weren't called white people, period. They were called Anuna. This is what they were called. It's exactly what they look like on Sumerian depictions. Alabaster skin, lapis lazuli blue eyes, and long beards. They weren't gods. They, weren't, they didn't come from space. They didn't fall out the sky. There, is, there are no spaceships, drop ships, drop shuttles, infrastructure in the sky. None of that exists in the Sumerian records. None of it. Anybody adopting the idea of ancient aliens does so because they're impressed with music, CGI, and a bunch of talking heads because there's zero evidence of ancient aliens. It does not exist. It is all matter of interpretation, and most of it's absolutely wrong. So this is what we have with the Sumerian text. We have a story told of a Indo-Iranian infrastructure that baffled the Sumerians who considered themselves and called themselves with great pride the black-headed people. They had smooth skin. It was, it was amazing to them that the Anuna could grow facial hair. To them, it was a sign of divinity. They called, in Egypt, they called them Shimsu Hor, and they thought it was so incredible that they could grow facial hair that pharaohs later, after the Anuna were gone, pharaohs then had their subjects carve for them wooden beards. So that, because the wooden beard became a status to the people of one who has been chosen to rule. This was copied by the, by the Chinese as well. The Chinese considered the, the strangers who were technologically advanced flying around on vimanas and, and dragon ships, dragon balloons, they called them dragon-faced. Because in the Chinese traditions, dragons had hair on their faces. Even today, of all the dragons in the world and all these different cultures, Chinese dragons have beards. This is what it was. Some even postulate over a hundred years ago in many of the old books I've read, some even postulate that the mark of Cain that would keep all the people from killing him when he went out among the strangers in his banishment, the mark of Cain that would keep them respecting him even though he was outlawed was the fact that he could grow facial hair. It's called the mark of Cain. I'm not the one that made that up. This is in a lot of books from a hundred years ago. So uh, let me sure I ain't looking at my chat. Let me look at my chat before I continue. Oh, we're just getting getting started, guys. I, I, I'm telling you, this might be a long visit, video. I hope you guys plan on spending Friday night with me. All right, let's see. <clears throat> 
Okay. Mm. Thank you, Don. Man, other people's coffee always tastes way better than if you make it yourself. Man. <clears throat> so, um, now, remember, if something is true, we will always be able to establish it from multiple different perspectives. I haven't cited all the traditions, nor will I have time for each one. But my specialty is calendrics. So if the heroes of the flood narrative and the, the, the subject matter of the flood traditions is Indo-Iranian cultures and peoples, then before the flood, who we know of as Anuna, who after the flood were also known as Anuna for a short period of time until outsiders started call, calling them Anuna Key. Anuna Key was the addition of an idea that these Anuna were from the deep, the underground. So they call them Anuna Key. Only after they were gone in an event that wiped them out, which was technologically advanced, that we're going to get into in this, in this, in this presentation, only after that did the Babylonian and Assyrian texts take a huge change, and they started calling them Anunnaki. And there was no more references to the Anuna of Gi at all. It was all Anunnaki. And now the Anunnaki, after centuries, had become gods. They had become star gods, and they were associated with this, and they were prayed to, and none of this is in the original materials at all. This is all embellishments added by priesthoods, added after a series of resets. We're looking at history through the lens of primitism caused by multiple forced resets. Humans keep getting taken down every time they get technologically advanced. Story, tower, the story of the, the Tower of Babel is just one of those stories. It's a story that was already ancient when a very similar event happened again. We're going to get to that. 2235 BC was four years after the Great Flood. When Noah had the vineyard, something happened, and that something is seen in the Vedic chronology. It's only seen in the Vedic chronology. Why is the Vedic chronology important to such an event? Because it's the Aryan calendar of the ancient world. It is the Indo-Iranian calendar. This is the 868th year of the Vedic chronology, which started in 3103 BC, is two periods of 434 years each. Stephen Jones, in his book, he's a biblical chronologist, but in his book, The, the Secrets of Time, he lays out his data sets explaining. He doesn't know why, but all throughout the Bible, these massive events where, where humanity is suddenly judged for things that they have done wrong in the past happen in intervals of 434 years. Don't confuse that with a cursed earth period, which is 414 years, which is a part of the Phoenix phenomenon. It's 138 times three. The judged, the judged epics, judged time is what Stephen Jones called it, is 434 years. Well, in this year of 2235 BC under the Aryan calendar is 868 Vedic chronology. And in this year, the son of Uranus, you know of him as Noah, his name is Kim, you also know of him as Kronos, he violates Noah's wife, Gia, called Nama in the Hebrew. He violates her, and the story is in the book of Genesis. It's also mentioned in Greek legends. It's told from a different perspective. Now, here's what the, what was fascinating about this is this isn't just two judged periods from the Aryan calendar. It's also ten judged periods precisely to the return of the chief cornerstone in 2106 A.D. The Vedic calendar is recording the. This is a, this is the a, most ancient, the most ancient 
insights into the prophetic spiritual symbolism of the chief cornerstone all comes from the Vedas. It all comes from the altar of Agni. Once you break down all the concepts that are attached to the altar of Agni and its 10,800 bricks, this altar, which is sitting in the middle of the land of Egypt and yet at the border thereof, which was finished in the year 1080, which is our 2815 BC, but it was 1080 of the pre-flood world, Annus Mundi. Once you understand that everything in the Rig Veda about the altar of Agni has everything to do with the knowledge of what the Great Pyramid is and what its function is. So we have this um, we have this corpus of material from the Sanskrit that's literally telling us to pay attention to the Indo-Iranian traditions and chronology because they have everything to do with what's going to ha happen in the last days. This chronology that hits 2235 is 868 years, 434 plus 434 to when something happens that now introduces a, a period a period of judgment that must unfold the son has laid with his mother the mother who was married to his father in genesis it doesn't really sound that way until you use scripture to interpret scripture because in the book of leviticus it says specifically when a man sees his father's nakedness he is cursed because it's not, it's not a euphemism. I mean, it's not just a general statement. It's a euphemism for having carnal relations with your father's wife. In this case, it was his own mother and his father's wife. This was Kim. You know him as Ham. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, you can miss me with that BS, that modern, that modern religious misinterpretation that Ham is the father of the black races. In black, it's not. It's not at all. Noah, Nama, Him, Shem, and Japheth are patriarchs of all Indo-Iranian pedigree. Have nothing to do with Black Africa and all that. Not, not at all. So no one, you don't accuse me of ever trying to say the Black race is cursed because all this happened to Jesus. It's not true. That is a false interpretation. The Great Flood only happened to a white civilization. The, the, the story unfolding in Genesis only concerned a curse that was being implemented against a white family. This is what's unfolding here. Kim ended up going to rule over Egypt. But I've already told you in multiple presentations, guys, there have always been two Egypts. One of them was cosmopolitan in the north where the Great Pyramids are. In the South, it was a different type of Egypt, a different culture, a different race. They don't even have a single pyramid down there. They buried their pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. It was totally different. What we have here in 2235 is a countdown to the return of the chief cornerstone who's going to undo all the damage that was done right here that, that led to the flood. And as soon as the flood was over, it happened again. Whatever the trespasses are, they're sexual here. It happened again four years after the flood, which is 1,440 days. It's a golden proportion number. But here it is again, 868 of the Vedic calendar, which counts 868 plus 868 plus 868 plus 868. I went all the way to 4340 years, the return of the chief cornerstone in 2106, the year 6,000. I'm not saying the world's 6,000 years old. Remember, the archaic chronology goes all the way back to 5239 BC. It's very, very close to the Armenian and the Byzantine ancient calendars of Trismegistus and Nostradamus. They knew of the world before the flood, the pre-Adamic world. So what we have here is Kim, because Noah was always now drunk, you can imagine Uranus is is the whole world. He was the king of the city of Shurapak. This is what the Sumerian records say, because they called him Unapishtim, which means the far away. And, and, and this is implicit because in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh himself found that Unapishtim was indeed far away because he did not dwell among men anymore. He was still depressed. Even after 300 years after the cataclysm, this Titan was still in sorrow. 
that the world was gone. The world he knew never came back. It was technologically advanced, and he missed it, and all his friends, all his family, and he never recovered from that. Noah became a drunk after the cataclysm. Now, what I'm also going to tell you is the story may not even be true, and it may just epitomize a phenomena that a whole generation just gave up because they'd lost everything and they weren't willing to rebuild. They knew in their lifetime they'd never be able to see even a modicum of the amenities that they had before. So the story typifies a scenario, whether it's real or not. The very first product being made after the Great Flood Cataclysm Reset is alcohol. So I'll drink to that. All right. I forgive me, Don. I do think this is going to be a long video. All right. And if you guys can't hang with me tonight, that's fine. You can come back and watch it. Watch 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 the rest of it this weekend. But I'm going to get this out cuz this is 390 years. We got a lot to cover and it's fascinating. So, uh yeah, using scripture to interpret scripture, we find out that when Ham saw his father's nakedness, it's merely a Hebrew euphemism for Ham, Kim, he had sex with his mom, probably when Noah was out, passed out drunk. So this is what we have. Now, they're not the only people around. Remember, this is all from an Indo-Iranian perspective. This is what's happening from, from the perspective of this, this, this once ruling family. Put things into their proper perspective. We are not hearing the history of humanity in the general. We are hearing the history here of the elite who lost everything from the pre-flood world. We, this is what this is about. This is what this family lineage is about. They are the survivors. Every, everybody else perished in their world. However, their world is full of other races but these other races to them are from the perspective of like the vikings and how they regarded the skraelings the vikings didn't go out killing skraelings there was no need there was no need for it the viking mindset was never even to draw a weapon against anybody who was unqualified to defend themselves the Vikings didn't even allow their, their young men to go out and fight if they had not first demonstrated prowess on the shield wall. The Vikings were very, these are Indo-Iranian people. They were very, they had a lot of etiquette when it came to war and dealing with other races. Remember the, remember the writings of Ibn Fadlan. He was a Muslim he was in a Muslim group, an Arab in a Muslim group, and they had a misunderstanding. The Vikings didn't understand. Uh, things got out, 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 things got out, out of uh, deals. And only those Arabians that drew their weapons were cut down by the Vikings. Ibn Fadlan did not draw a weapon. He, had, he, he was a writer. He's a scribe. And they honored that, and they made him one of the group. And everywhere the Vikings went, this is how we got a real good window into Viking culture. It was from the perspective of an Arabian who survived, learned the language, and traveled with them for two and a half years. His name is Ibn Fadlan. And he did this. The Vikings saw the Skraelings as basically the spirits of, of the land. Skraelings are like the North American Indians. When the Vikings came into contact with, with the straight, black-haired, smooth-skinned people una, unable to, to, to will a beard, they weren't hostile toward them. There was no need to. There was no need to be because they regarded them as part of the environment. Vi Vikings would, would only start donning their weapons and getting aggressive when they came in the presence of equals, with those who were also armored, moving around. Vikings would fight each other. So it's the same mindset as what was going on even thousands of years previously. Same mindset. The Anuna were surrounded by races for which they didn't really regard because they, they saw them as primitive totem societies, barely surviving, doing whatever they had to do. In the pre-flood world, they were, they were basically hunter-gatherers. 
Because in the pre-flood world, everything was accessible. Food was everywhere. Insects were larger. Meat was meat was in plenty. It was everywhere. In the vapor canopy, in the vapor canopy period, there was no gardening. There was none of that was needed. And food was abundant. After this cataclysm, now now the world had become a very hostile place because people needed to, to eat, and the flora and fauna had been greatly depreciated after the sky fell. It's no longer the same world. It became, it became a world, a world of, of, of violence. And here we have Noah, the story of Noah. Somebody's just not coping. So they're just, they're gone. They just decided to go and drink their life away. We don't have any more stories of Uranus or Noah after this point, except for two references, one in the Greek and one in, in, in uh, rabbinical literature. Uh, I believe it's the book of Jasher or maybe Jubilees that explains that after the cataclysm, Noah and Nama had more sons and daughters. Those sons and daughters are, became, the, became the rulers of the generation that rose up after the flood because all the titans that survived, Shem, Kim, uh, Yapatos, you know them as Japheth, they never became anything. They're just in the background. And I have a feeling I know why. It was always their sons and daughters that became the great, like Semiramis. But the original Titans couldn't breathe. Noah couldn't breathe. They just couldn't do all the things that they, they, they normally could do. They were, they were much larger. So they were, they were like the Sumerian records de depict. They were the Lugalum. They were the, the generation called the Big Brothers. Yeah, and after humans became so, so multiplied so much, they started passing laws against the giants. We're going to get to that here. They even created, they even created tests that if you proved that you were longer than the bed they laid you in, they went ahead and strapped you to that bed and they had winches and cranks and they pulled you apart and killed you. This was practiced at Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. This is this is in the historical record, guys. They were trying to trying to kill and eliminate anybody who was a certain height and taller. Jason's not making this up. This is real. After the collapse of the vapor canopy, humans multiplied rapidly. But when they did, they found they're very they're much smaller than their parents, and their parents were slightly smaller than their gigantic Titanic moms and dads. They're the grandparents of normal sized humans. This is the world we're entering in right now in this narrative. But right now, four years after the cataclysm, no one knows that they're giant. No one even realizes they're huge. They just don't know. They don't start, they don't start knowing until development, until generate, you know, within within 10 to 12 years, babies are born. So Noah and Nama had other sons and daughters after the flood. One of those sons. Well, actually, a grandson became became famous all over the world. He founded a kingdom in the Peloponnesus. His name he was named King Inachus, but King Inachus in Hebrew is Anak, and his sons became known as the Anakim. These are the Anakim giants that are very prolific in the Old Testament, in the Book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. There's a whole race of giants called Anakim. These are also the 318 retainers. The Hebrews sanitized it. For, for whatever reason, the Hebrew translators did not accurately translate the passage of the 318 retainers that helped Abram go rescue Lot and slaughter the entire Elamite federation of five armies that came and sacked Sodom and Gomorrah. Instead, it says retainers, but that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, and 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 uh, Abram went and got his allies. One of them was Mamre, called the Oak. But Mamre ruled uh, uh, ruled over the sons of Anak, and the Hebrew says it was three hundred and eighteen Anakim. Therefore, Abram to go rescue his his nephew Lot. When Lot stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole city got, the cities got sacked by the Elamites and the Hittites, 
he took 318 giants with his own household knights and retainers, and they went, and that's how they overcome them. But the book of Genesis tries to make it sound like Abraham was a mighty warrior with just a few people. He, he slaughtered 60,000 something soldiers. That's not, that's not what really happened. That's not what really happened. The slight translation took servants, made it look like servants when it was actually, he took some giant warriors and they went and they, and they, and they cleaned house. Okay. So this is four years after the flood. And it, and it lines forward and backward in time. It lines up perfectly with the Vedic area, area and timeline chronology. And we have here, this is what's, what's, what, the reason why this is so important is because this incident where Kim had sex with his own mother, the wife, Nama, the wife of, of Uranus, you know him as Noah, the offspring that was conceived was Cush. This is how Kronos was introduced into the into the into the uh, field, and Kronos was a beast. We're gonna get to him now. Kron Kronos was a uh, remember he's the one that ate, ate all the children. He's the one. He's the one to keep because of a prophecy because of what he did to his own mother. There was a prophecy by somebody else that that he was gonna be un he was gonna be undone by one of his children. So he was he was a, he was like sexual he had a, a sexual appetite where he was just having sex with all these different women, but he made sure that he killed every single one every single child any child born by him he made sure they died. And in the in the Greek traditions he was given a stone, and he ate the stone, which actually probably is probably a furnace or whatever I don't know, but. It says in the tradition he ate the stone, thinking it was it was the baby, but the baby was raised and, and set aside. And this baby in the Greek traditions became Zeus. So Zeus Zeus later avenged Uranus because Kronos cut off the genitals of, of Uranus. And the reason he did that is because he feared the Titans. The reason we have the story of Noah being castrated is because he kept having sons and daughters after the great flood through Nama, who was a pre-flood titaness. So people born a hundred years after the great flood were already being born. Their genetics, what was happening was they're getting smaller and smaller because now their parents are just regular gigantic or semi-giants. But when Noah and Nama had another original child, that child's huge, huge. And then their children would become smaller and smaller and smaller from generation. This created the race, the race of the Anakim and offshoots other Titans that are not a part of this story gave, gave birth to the race of the Emums and the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, the Horums, all the, the Rephaim. The and the Rephaim were, were considered so vile that they were the unresurrected ones. These are the Rephaim. Actually, proper Hebrew, Rephaim, walking dead. <clears throat> so uh, this is the problem. This is what we have in the Greek. Kronos realized if I keep allowing my dad to keep having kids, then within 20 years, there's going to be an army of giants out here. They're going to finally take, take, take this throne back because he took the throne. So this is 2235 BC. It's a part of the Vedic calendar. And all this stuff after the flood, all this evil stuff was introduced because Kim laid with his mother while Uranus was either drunk or whatever. Whatever, whatever he was doing. Whatever he was doing. So let's see here. Let's go. Kronos, okay. I think we're done. So this was the 868th year, 434 plus 434 of the Kali Yuga, which began the Black Age timeline, 3103 BC, which starts 10 judge time periods, a countdown to the return of the chief cornerstone, 2106 AD. If you want, want, want to read more of that story, it's Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 27, and you can read the Greek uh, Theognis, uh, Theogony by Hesiod. So, six years after the Great Flood, 
Six years after the Great Flood is the year 2233. This is the founding of the city of Babili. Babili would later be called Babylon, but at this time it's called Gate of God, Babili. So this is also when Dilmun is established. Six years after the Great Flood, the Anuna established on an island of Bahrain, a, a, a city and a port with quays and all that called Dilmun, and they began coming from somewhere else far away to where they used Dilmun as a staging area. And then other ships would leave Dil, Dilmun and come up the Tigris Euphrates and then they started laying the, the, the they started laying infrastructure as early as six years after the total systemic collapse we now have two primary places that are interacting with each other now now with ships merchandise remember guys the great flood story that's passed down by the Jews is a lie the whole world was not flooded it wasn't it was Middle Earth that was flooded. It was the Mediterranean world. And that just happened to be occupied centrally, millions and millions of Indo-Iranian people. Their world was flooded. So then they came up. And this is why, this is why Turkey is so archaeological, is archaeology rich. It's because when this basin, this, this Garden of Eden series of valleys that was the Mediterranean and Black Sea and the Dardanelles, when that filled up with water, when the Atlantic breached the, the Pillars of Hercules, all that filled up, they lost all those cities, but right there in safe high ground, right there is Turkey. Turkey's right there. And it just goes up in elevation all the way up to Ararat. All in our in Armenia, all that area was super safe. So where do you think the Aryan populations went after they just watched ninety percent of their population drown and all their cities lost? Where do you think? Of course they're going to the mountains, and that's exactly where what we find in the Sumerian text. In the Sumerian text, all the histories of the Anun in the Sumerian text are not in the Euphrates Tigris Basin, which is a valley of alluvium. It's not, that's not where they were written. Many scholars have noticed that wherever these histories are about the Anuna, it couldn't have been in, in Babylonia, Assyria, or what, what present day Sumer is and all that. It could not have been in the Iran, Iraq region. Couldn't have been. Because of all the metallurgy, all the mining, all, all the underground things that are referenced, uh, uh, sweet water underground, uh, uh, especially mountains. The Anuna were, a, were an alpine race. They only moved into the lower valley, valleys after they were in Turkey for a while. And this is what we find in the Book of Jasher, what we find in the rabbinical writings. This is what we find in the ancient Greek traditions. After the Deucalion flood, the survivors went east. When they went east, they looked for an area, an area to build. And when they found it, they called it Shinar. Some say Shinar is Sumer. But Shinar, Shinar is later called Babili. Or at least the capital city is called Babili. Babili is gate of God. It is what it is what later became known as, as Babylon. So this is after the flood. Here we have. Six years after the flood, we have building starting. Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa are pre-flood civilizations that date back to the 26th century BC. They were they were they were Anuna as well. They're being rebuilt at this time because they were destroyed, but they but they're on high ground. They weren't flooded out. Now they're being rebuilt, and they're not going to suffer a ter they're not going to suffer anything for centuries but you're going to hear what they suffer. It's in this presentation. So <coughs> moving on, uh, the reason we know about 2233 and the foundation of Babylon is because in the days of Alexander of Macedon, after he took Babylon, Callisthenes, his personal friend and scribe, I say friend, but he later executed him because he got a smart mouth. But uh, Callisthenes uh, went in there and he talked to the Babylonian priests and he looked at their, their, their deals and they told him how many hundreds of thousands of shards back Babylon was founded. This is really interesting because I, I, I showed you guys in a prior presentation. Callisthenes listened to them and understood instantly how to translate hundreds of thousands of shards into a Greek date. He instantly did it and he, and he came up with, oh, okay, so... 
It was 1,903 years before Alexander of Macedon became Alexander the Great and sat on the throne of Babylon. And the Greek priests agreed. I'm mean, excuse me, and the, and, the, and the Babylonian priests agreed. So it's a, a hundreds of thousands of shores with only 1,903 years. 1,903 years from the time that, that Alexander took Babylon is precisely 2233 B.C founding of, of Babylon. And in the Babylonian traditions, Babylon was built right after the Great Flood. Every bit of it comports. It's very, it's, it, just, it just flows together. This is the writing, this is the uh, the uh, the projection of Callisthenes. It's rather famous among, in chronological writings. So, let's see. 18 years after the flood. Now we're moving. 18 years after the flood. 18 years is a good little, is a good ways. Think about it now. The whole world, imagine how we would be today if the entire world was destroyed in 2006. Imagine if the whole world was destroyed in 2006 and we no longer have our little bags with our little technological devices. We no longer have these little things called me's in the Sumerian that allows us to, to move objects, to communicate over long distances, to talk to other gods. We no longer have these. This is why after the flood, they wrote on tablets of clay because they remember the real tablets that were technological before that. And they remember tablets are how you conveyed knowledge. Yeah, so this is a, we don't have these anymore. 2006, the whole world collapsed. Where do you think we'd be today? We wouldn't be on, you wouldn't be listening to me on the internet. That's for sure. No, we, we, would, be, we, would, we would be in micro communities learning how to farm, learning how to do all kinds of things, and, and the world would have been a, a fundamentally different place. If there was a total systemic collapse in the year 2006, I promise you, most of us that were alive in 2006 wouldn't be listening to me right now. No. Wouldn't even be alive. Yeah, because a total systemic collapse does not just have a, lo a, lo a loss of life during the event, but life is continually lost, even in the next year, in the next year after that, it becomes a mathematical pattern and it diminishes. It diminishes as time passes until there's a stabilizing factor. And ordinarily, after a reset, the stabilizing factor is always what is the population and what is the population's sustainability for whatever food is available. If they're on a coastline and somebody has taught everybody else how to fish and all that, then then a coastal a coastal community is going to be far more populated a hundred years later than a community that's inland having to uh, uh, basically hunt and and gather. Hunter gatherer communities never become very populated. Never. Coastal communities can become populated really fast, but it's still not sustain sustainable over long periods of time. So. 18 years ago was 2006, but in this narrative, 18 years after the great flood, Nama, the wife of Noah, a titaness, is 700 years old. She's 700. She's not hundreds of thousands of years old. This ain't, this ain't the Billy Carson Shar version of history. She's 700 years old, and I don't even know if that's true. I'm just going by what the historical record says as it, as it has been passed down to us today. So Nama is 700 years old. She's still alive. She's the mother now of Arba. Arba is only mentioned one time in the Old Testament. His name is Arba. And his only claim to fame is that he is the father of the gigantic uh, Anak. Anak is the, patriot, is the patriarch of the Anakim giants who are famous in the Old Testament. But they're also famous outside the Old Testament as well. But uh, this is a, uh, yeah, Arba, the Anakim, and a, uh, a couple daughters, they're all born after the flood. And they're all, they're born after Kim, uh, Shem, and Japheth, or, or Yapatos. So this is, two, two, this is 2221 B.C., 18 years after the Great Flood. She, remember, in all the traditions, she was older than Noah, but she doesn't look her age. Now, 
in the vapor canopy world, people didn't wrinkle up. They didn't grow old like that. Uh, a seven, uh, someone who was, you know, equal to a seven-year-old now, and when they were equal to a seven-year-old, they probably looked like a 35, 36-year-old, and they just wouldn't grow old. It was after the collapse of the vapor canopy, after the decrease in atmospheric pressure, with the loss of amb ambient radiation, the nutrition, everything has changed. It affected us all the way down to the genetic level. So now when we grow old, we look old. But in the Titan period, it is said many times in traditions that Titans would, would be very old, but they wouldn't look it. And then they would just die. So this is a, Nama was probably very, very beautiful at, at, at whatever age she was after the flood when this happened. Noah was 618 years old at this time. So uh, now um, it's really interesting that we have a correlate in America. And I don't know if this is because of Carrion, Pelasgian, uh, uh, Syrophoenician, Libyan, or, or um, uh, Carthaginian passages over the Atlantic to the ancient world, because we know it happened. We have a lot of evidence of those travels in the ancient world. But I don't know. But I do know that in, in uh, the Americas, there was the legends of Bokika, and in the legends of Bokika, he was a wise old man who survived a flood, and he was very beloved of the people. But he had a very sexually promiscuous wife, and she was always causing him all kinds of all, all kinds of problems. And uh, his name is Bokika, and you can you can probably learn about him. Uh, you'll you will learn about him in Archaics Academy, but. You can learn about it. You can probably look him up. I, you might be able to Google him. But I, I have some old books about American, ancient American traditions, and Bokika was very prominent. He is Noah. The, the, the memories of the ancient American Bokika is Noah and his wife. And uh, she was sexually promiscuous, uh, a wicked woman who continually stressed out her husband. Um, she had many sons after the flood. And that's about all, all I've got written on my notes right here on, on Bokika. But in the ancient traditions, Bokika, Bokika is no different than the, the Greek Deucalion. He is Neruus. I've told you guys in my, in, my, in my presentations before, the Achaeans remembered Noah as Neruus. He's even seen on the Titanomachy, the War of the Titans and Giants. He's even seen hidden in the background of the Titanomachy. He is the father of the Nereids, the 50, the 50 demigoddesses that were mermaids. Uh, see. He, became, he became the ancient god of the sea, and his name Neruus preserved the ancient Anuna calendar, Ner, which is 600 years. Just like Noah is really just an anagram for Anu, a Sumerian god. And the number four, what? 600 years. Noah was 600 years when the Great Flood took place. So, um, okay, cool. So this is Name of 700 years old, and her and Noah have been married for 120 years, since 2341 B.C., before the flood, before they had their firstborn son, either Yapatos or Kim, one of them. I can't remember which one it was. So, matter of perspective, the year 1990. I was 17 years old in 1990, and I went to prison. So... 1990 for me was a long time ago. As a matter, 1990 was 34 years ago. 34 years ago. So as a matter of perspective, here's 34 years after the flood. 34 years ago is a long time ago. Oh, the whole world could have been through a lot of things in 34 years. Think about everything we've been through since 1990. All the changes in culture, all everything. I mean, even 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 not 9/11, uh, 9/11, Afghan wars, uh, all the all. Uh, um, uh, the uh, Sarajevo, the Bosnian Wars, all, all man, we've been through a lot since the, in the 90s, all the way up until today. Hell, look at this bumbling idiot we got for a president. We've been through, we've been through a lot. 34 years since 1990. 34 years after the Great Flood is the founding in 2205 BC. It is the founding of the Chinese Sai Dynasty of Yu. Yu is the Chinese Noah. He he foresaw the flood and built an ark. The Chinese version is 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 very similar to the Atrahasis epic, the, the Sumerian text on the flood. So uh, this is the Chinese dynasty. 34 years after the great flood, 
the Chinese build their uh, begin a new dynasty. Now, I'm going to tell you now, I believe it's wrong. And you're going to see evidence for why I believe it's wrong here in a minute. Because I have noticed that a lot of the older Chinese dates are all 30 to 35 years off. And that's and that's and that's because once once they used one chrono marker to date several other things, that one chrono marker was thirty to thirty five years off, and it got everything before that dated off. Same thing that happened with the Jewish calendar, and the reason why it's one hundred and thirty four years off from all the calendars that that, that, that are operable today. So, uh, let's see, I'll show I'll show you why I believe that in a minute when we get to it. So yeah, the, the Sai Dynasty would last 439 years. That's a long time for a dynasty to last, but that's the Chinese. The Chinese have always been static like that. They've always been static like that. They go long periods of time with almost zero development. Long periods of time, unless there's some type of outside source or some internal genius, and that happens too. But they stifle out the genius over and over and over because they don't continue their work. They just regard them as something that was anomalous, and they continue on. China has like the longest unbroken uh, culture in the world, maybe except for outside, outside, you know, Aboriginal. All right, so that's 34, 34 years after they begin this dynasty, and it's a pyramid building dynasty in the Zhan precinct, wherever that place is. You guys know you've seen the pyramids in China; they're real secretive about them. But, but yeah, they start building all kinds of pyramids and stuff. Uh, it, it's a X, it's X I A N. Jean, it's the Jean or something. I can't remember. But those are really weird because they paint them. Yeah, they're painted on the north face. The the big pyramid is painted black. Uh, it's blue gray on the east face. On the on the south, it's red and it's white on the west and yellow on the flat top surface. It's yellow. So very unusual. But the Chinese, they love that yellow. The Yangtze River is the yellow river. So 39 years after the Great Flood, 39 years after the Great Flood is 2200 BC. This is the estimate provided by Latin writer 2000 years ago, Marcus Varro, who, said, who estimated that this was the time of the Great Flood. It's a pretty good estimate because the world is still destroyed. It's 39 years after the Great Flood, and the world's still destroyed. It still hasn't woke up. It's still barely struggling. So uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's a scientific bullseye. You know, scientists, they give themselves plus or plus or minus 200 years and all that. So Marcus Varro did pretty good. He's 39 years off. Uh, 39 years ago was 1985. A little matter of perspective. So let's see. Oh, something else that happened 20, in 2200 BC. What is this? Uh, I believe this is. Is that him? Or kind of? Yeah. 2200 BC, which is equal to our 1985. If the world had been destroyed back in 1985, we have uh, Uruk Kaijina. I'm not how, sure how you pronounce it. But this guy here, he has a he has a vision in Ningursu, the god Ning Ningursu. He calls on Ningursu, Ningursu appears to him, and he tells Ningursu the problem, what's going on. And Ningursu tells him, basically the god tells him, we have very ancient laws for when this happened before. Listen to this. This is crazy. The god Ningursu tells this guy, Uruk Kagina, he tells him the problem. And the problem is, is that humans of ordinary size are getting taken advantage of by the Lugals, the Lugalim, the big men. But the big men are so prestigious and everybody respects them, nobody wants to say anything. This is what's happening. Humans are small compared to their titanic parents, huge parents. So this this guy has, has a conference, well, according to the record, uh, this Ningursu tells him, hey, man, uh, we have very ancient law in place that deals with this. So, so the guy goes through the ancient laws and finds them and realizes, oh, they got, they got some equality laws that keep the Lugals and the Lugal Bandas from, 
from just mowing over ordinary sized people because of their prestige and because of their size. So he implements a whole new law code, adding in all, all these restrictions on trade and on commerce and barter and stuff, uh, dealing with the Lugals, the big brothers. I thought that was really interesting when I found that. Yeah, you only find this in old books, guys. You know, yeah, I've never seen Zechariah Sitchin talk about none of this, but Samuel Noah Kramer does. Samuel Noah Kramer was already translating Sumerian texts way before Zechariah Sitchin ever came around. But Samuel Noah Kramer gives a lot of detail about the, the big men, the Lugals. Yeah, this is, is amazing to find just a piece of legislation out there that, that regulated uh, fair trades between people who were of different sizes. It's amazing. It's amazing. All right, so uh, that's 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 circa. It could be two thousand BC. It could be twenty two. They just they just don't know. So they but but the legislation exists. We just don't know exactly chronologically when it would fit in here. But this is generally the time period. It's just generally the time period. All right, so moving on. So 45 years after the Great Flood, let me check my chat again. Check my chat again real quick. Mm. Hobbits, face diver said hobbits. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're the hobbits compared to them. All right. What's up, Jeffrey Bailey? All right. So let's get back in it. Chat's going just fine. I'm keyed up. Hour and a half. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I got another hour and a half for me at least. 45 years after the Great Flood would be equal to our 1979. Think back to 1979, and that's when this right here, uh, what we have right here, I'm about to read, 2194 B.C was 45 years after the Great Flood. Now, we don't, we don't have anything that happened, but what we do have is the Dutch Oralind Manuscript specifically gives us a date for the Great Flood. And when you use the chrono markers in uh, the Oralind text, we have a date of 2194 for the Great Flood. That's pretty damn accurate. For a text that was written 15 centuries ago, and then it went through translation like 700 years ago, that's pretty damn interesting that it would get 45 years within the accurate date for the Great Flood. This is the Oralind manuscript. It's a Frisian manuscript. Remember, the Oralind is a part of a group like the Book of Jasher, the Oralind, the Colburn Bible, Nostradamus, and Mother Shipton. All five of these are shunned by scholars. But the common denominator between them all is they accurately record chronological Phoenix phenomenon uh, dates. I know why academia shuns those texts. All right, 60 years after the Great Flood. Now, a lot of you weren't alive because I wasn't alive either. But this is the same thing as 1964 to us. 60 years after the Great Flood. This is the date of 2179 BC. This is the Tolte Toltec water sun age. According to the Toltecs, this is when the great flood destroyed everything. But it's very, it's, it's very, we understand how this happened though. And it's because <laughs> 1656 years of the pre flood world divided by, let me do, let me show you, divided by Jubilees is 33. I'm going to show you something. 1656 divided by 50 years is 33. In ancient America, they remember that the flood happened in the 33rd, 33rd generation. But the generations in ancient America were based off a 13-wheel calendar. Therefore, 52 was the holy number of the ancient Americas. Just like it's the holy number of the Mayan long count. Look at this. 33 times 52 is 1716. Why is this important? Because 1716 Anno Mundi is 60 years after the Great Flood. It is our 2179 BC. 
we just saw exactly how the Toltecs dated the Great Flood, and they dated it based off a of memory that it was 33 years to a, 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 a it was 33 sections of the pre-flood world. They just merely took those 33 and applied it to their calendar round. The calendar round is 52. 52 times 33 provides this date. But they were off because the pre-flood world was 50 year segments that we know later from, from the Shabbat system of Babylon are called Jubilees. It's a 49-year period, and a 50th year is to rest the land. And then it's a 49-year period, and the 50th year is to rest the land. The ancient Americans didn't, didn't apply the Jubilee. They applied the calendar round. That's why they got the date wrong. But if, but if we undo that mistake, they nailed the date of the Great Flood. The Toltecs did. All right, so let's move on. So they use the calendar round for everything. I'm going to tell you guys right here too. Uh, the Toltecs say that they left the old world and ended up in the Americas and they founded a city called, a place called Anahuac. This is interesting. And they built a city called Wanaco. Who Anak? It is literally in Spanish, H-U, and then a capital A-N-A-K, Hugh Anak, place of Anak, which is Wanaco. They built this place in Mexico 520 years after the flood. That's amazing. 520 years, which is 10 calendar rounds. They're really stuck on that 52 number. They also claimed that the that the gods destroyed the, 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 the Tower of Cholulu. Get this. In the American version, the tower that was destroyed and all the languages were, were separated, the same story as in Mexico. But in Mexico, it's not a tower. It's a pyramid. A pyramid was built, and it offended the gods, and the gods came down and separated the languages. In the American version, it was 52 plus 52 years after the flood that the languages were separated because they built an offensive pyramid. Amazing. Can't, you can't, just can't make this stuff up. So we get to the next date. Next date. 98 years after the flood. It's equal to our 1926. This is 2141 B.C., this is the founding of the Ison chronology. It has kingship founded at Kish, 35,000 shards after the flood. When you take a calculator and you and you divide 35,000 by the Sumerian sexagesimal uh, system of 360 days a year, 360 turnings of the stars, you get precisely 97.2 years. Archaeology comports with with this interpretation of the shards here's another here's another bullet in our belt concerning the accurate interpretation of shards the Ison chronology has kingship founded at kish in babylonia 35,000 shards after the flood well the great flood was 2239 bc so we're not going to we're not going to look 30,000 years into the future for the end of a dynasty that archaeology tells us ended in the 20th, 20, 20, uh, 20th millennium BC. Do you see now? Shars could never mean years. They have to mean days. So, Ison chronology is founded. It is 35,000 shars after the flood, which is 97.2 years after the flood. Finally, the city of Kish gets moving, gets moving. They, they build their infrastructure and they start kingship. All right. Moving on. Oh, this is in uh, Professor Waddell's book, page 141, Egyptian Civilization, Its Sumerian Origin. It's one of my favorite books. So now... Our 1916 was a long time ago. 
none of us, none of y'all listening to my voice was alive in 1916. I don't think, unless we got a real OG in, in, listening to us right now, nobody was, was alive in 1916. It was 108 years after the flood. 1916 was 108 years ago. So 108 years after the flood was the year 2131 B.C. 2131 B.C., the Chaldean dynasty is founded 39,180 shars after the flood. So 39,180 shars divided by 360 turnings of the stars is simply 108 years. Here we have another, another piece of, of, of strong evidence that the shars are days. Everything is, is waking up. It's 108 years after the flood and these dynasties are now starting. Humans have populated. They now have legislation in place that keeps giants and titans from just running over them just because they're small. And I don't mean running over them by stepping on them. They weren't that big. Yeah, and, and all the only evidence I've found is titans could have been as much as 14 to 15 feet high. Giants would have been 9 to 10 feet and then ordinary size humans, which these sizes are still colossal. But these are the sizes that also agree with everything we found in the Old Testament as well. So, um, so here it is, 108 years after the flood, civilization is moving. It's moving right now. Population explosion, people's cereals are growing, all kinds of stuff. So, and we know that just by looking at the Babylonian cuneiform. Babylonian cuneiform for this period right here talks about land deeds, titles, taxes, talks about shipping manifests, talks about uh, cargoes going up and down the Euphrates and Tigris, uh, uh, overland, overland trade trains and all that. Yeah, 108 years after the flood, yeah, people were all, people, civilization was continuing on. Now, it didn't have all the advancements and amenities of the pre-flood world, hadn't got to that point yet, but everything was okay. People were surviving. So let's, all right, we're moving on. 118 years after the flood. 118 years after the flood was, 19, was equal to our 1906. 1906 was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. The Masila, was it the Ma, the uh, the Masila earthquakes, 1906? Yeah, I think the earthquake in and I, I guess it's pronounced Masila, Masilia, in Europe. See, that's uh, 1906. That's crazy. 118 years ago is equal right here in our study to 2121 BC, the year 1774, Anno Mundi. So in this year, Nama, the Titanus, the promiscuous wife of Uranus or Noah, is 800 years old. And she is now the mother of Semiramis. Semiramis would become one of the most famous queens to have ever, ever lived. She would be queen of Babylon. Oh, she's just like her mama. This is 2121 BC. All right, let's see. Now, 120 years, 120 years after the Great Flood, this is a great shore, according to Barosis. Remember the pre-flood world from the appearance of the of the Anuna to the Great Flood was 10 periods of 120 years, and he called them shars. That's exactly what Barossa said. He said 10 shars from the arrival of the Anuna to the Great Flood. Ten, it was exactly 10 shars is what he said. And that means that it was 10 periods of 120 years. The same thing that God told Noah to prepare for in 120 years, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood and all that. And then Moses was told, or Noah was then told, my, my, my spirit will not always strive with man for his years will now be 120 years. When well, the pre-flood world, 120 times 10 is exactly 12 centuries which is the Sumerian, in Sumerian shars is 432,000 turnings of the stars, which is precisely what we find in Sumerian texts. 
they say the Dingir, the gods, appeared 432,000 shars before the flood swept over the earth. That's a, that's a actual that's an actual quote from a Sumerian text. So it's uh it all fits perfectly. This is 120 years uh after the great flood, which would be equal to our great flood happening in the year 1904. In this year, in the 120th year, a man named Canaan, according to the Book of Jubilees, and his name could have been anything, but ancient artifacts covered in writing that, that, that were supposed to have been left behind by the giants before the flood were found and excavated. And when news, when, when news uh, of the discovery of the sciences of the Anuna was found, Noah panicked and ordered that all these things be be uh, be reburied, although that's not what happened. And uh, what we have here is the excavation of the ancient pre-flood city of Sippar. Sippar, it was known as, as the city of books. Now, uh, this is found in the 120th year after the flood. This is when technological advancements now now just 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 begin blossoming. Whatever they found allow allowed them to to just start building cities, mass producing all kinds of infrastructure, manufacturing. This event, 120 years after the flood, is basically what led to all the events that follow. It was the finding, it was the finding of these ancient sciences, these artifacts, and this knowledge, and then not destroying it. So this is uh, 2119 BC. This is precisely 1776 Anno Mundi. 1776. It's also 720, 10 processional, 10 processional units, 72 times 10. 720 of the Anunnaki dynasty. This is 720 years since the first year of the oppression. This is the Nephilim dynasty before the flood. 2839 BC. And it's the 120th year after the flood. That's when this artifact was found. All right. Let's move on. 134 years after the flood is equal to our 1890 AD. Do you see how this perspective works? Do you understand how much? It's the year 2024. Our world today is not even comparable. I mean, I mean, the world of 1890 isn't even comparable to what we experience today in technology, all these advancements, everything we've been through in the 1910s after 1902, when everything exploded onto the world scene. 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Think about how much the world changed in the 1980s, 1990s, exploded with the internet. Then the thousands, now look at us, we're in 2024. Their world would have not been different than ours. Remember, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. And the things that I'm reading to you now are done with a primitive veneer. You have to understand there was technology back then. It may not have been widespread. It probably wasn't ubiquitous at all, but it was there. And we have the evidence of every generation in ancient technology surviving somewhere and in some fashion. So this is what we have. 134 years after total systemic collapse does not mean all the knowledge was lost. All those surviving Titans still understood all those things from the pre-flood world. They may not have been their expertise. They may not be able to manufacture and build all these things, didn't have all the tools, but the knowledge of potential, how that, that these things could be rebuilt and redesigned. 134 years is a long time to stay down. It's a long time to stay down for a technologically advanced society because that society would have become a steampunk type society. There wouldn't have been a total 100% loss of everything. There would have been all kinds of innovative ways to do things. And within two to 10 years, people would have had all kinds of new ways to do things that would have developed into to new technologies. So 134 years later, 
We're not surprised that all of a sudden the world is absolutely teeming with people again. Remember, don't believe the Jewish redacted version that the only eight people survived and that and that the whole world flooded and everybody was dead. It's not true. All the human, you know, uh, blood types and all that in the world did not derive from eight Indo-Iranian people who survived on an on ark. It's not true. It's not true. Human diversity shows that the world has been here for a, long, a much longer period of time and gone through many other systemic resets. But this is this event, 2105 BC, is 134 years after the Great Flood, which would have been equal to our 1890. In this year, the Venus Almanac of Amazaduga, the Hittite king, the begin notes that this was the beginning of the Mesopotamian dynasty. This is basically describing an empire where one city was now ruling multiple cities. This is recorded in the Venus Almanacs. Remember, I told you guys multiple times there was no zodiac in the ancient world. All these are ex post facto imp impositions by modern authors who do not know what they're talking about. The Mool Appen of ancient Babylon was six signs, and they don't even comport with the, with the 12 signs of the Zodiac. They're totally different. They were fascinated by Venus. Venus almanacs of Sumer and Babylon and Akkad were prolific in the cuneiform. The Venus almanacs are tabulate, tabulate periods of time going forward and backward. They recorded comets, sky phenomena, all kinds of crops, cereals, plant seasons. All this was done by the Venus almanacs, not just in the Near East, but also by the Maya and the Zapotec. They too went by the Venus almanacs. Venus, the star Sirius, Arcturus, Orion, the seven Pleiades, these are the things the ancient, the ancient world paid attention to. The Greeks, and only late in Greek, not, not even, not even in, in early or mid, we're talking at the very end of Greek society. During the Ptolemy dynasty is when the zodiac was introduced, the zodiac that we know of today. And the reason I'm, I'm, I, I keep hammering this into you guys is because you've got to understand how incredibly deceitful some of these modern books are that try to date Gobekli Tepe and Cattle Huyuk and, and, and pyramids and statues in Egypt, and they use zodiacal dating. And they apply 2,160 years to each house so they can get their dumbass younger driest dating. It's all bullshit, every bit of it. That's why I'm always hammering it into you guys. Here it is right here. The Venus Almanacs established, established under Amazaduga that Mesopotam Mesopotamian dynasty started about 2105 BC. This means, uh, and, this, and this, was, this was published well over 120 years ago right here. This is Egyptian civilization, uh, Professor Waddell. This is some fascinating stuff. I told you guys, one of my, one of my favorites aside from Lenormand, is Professor Waddell. After that, Thor Heyerdahl. you got to read these older pre-World War II researchers because when you, when you do, you're getting the facts. You're not getting the redacted versions that came out after the Nuremberg trials. You're getting the core good data on, on, the, on the history of the world. Now, I'm not talking about scientific books because the scientific books of uniformitarianism started getting pushed in the 1870s and 1880s real hard. But, but they're still good books. There's still good good geologists and scientists who are who are who are releasing some fascinating stuff up to the 1920s, but yeah, the scientific world we are in, in our in our old books, the scientific the shift in the science was basically hijacked by the fraternal benefit societies. You know them as the Elks and the the, the Elks and the Moose Lodge foresters, Masons. Uh, they pretty much hijacked the scientific deal and started promoting a bunch of bullshit starting in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. But it wasn't real, real prolific to the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. But when it comes to his history, it took a lot longer. Up until World War II, a lot of the history books were nailing it. Exactly how all these things unfolded. Only after World War II did all these encyclopedias and all these old books start tailoring history and sanitizing it and basically removing good old white folks from the equation. This is what was going on from World War II on. Basically, they did everything in their in their power to to remove the Indo-Iranian fa family from all all these traditions and assign them to to other cultures. So this is what this is what's going on. Um, 
This is like Robert Seifert will educate you on a lot of this as well. The man knows what he's talking about on, on these topics. There, there is quite a bit of crossover, although we come from totally different vantage points. Okay, now, um, okay, 138 years after 1886. Mm. Yes, D. Light, you're right. It's not just the Carnegie Library. Rockefellers, Rothschilds, the Carnegies, and some others started funding libraries all over America. And those new books in those libraries, no good. No good. The Flying Arrow. Oh, I'm glad you're driving listening to me, right? I've listened to many, many YouTube videos while I was contracting driving. I did many videos while I was contracting and driving. <clears throat> All right. Friday night fever, guys. We're going. It's we've been doing this two hours, and I'm telling you, I'm about I'm dropping bombs. This is some fascinating material we're getting into, and uh, yeah, I got to get into it because I'm I'm far I'm far behind. Well, this is only 138 years after the flood. We're going 390 years after the flood. All right, so get your big boy pants on tonight. 138 years at, at 138 years after the flood is equal to our 1886. Think about all how the world has changed all the way since 1886. One thing that's very inter interesting is there isn't a single person alive today that was alive 138 years ago. That number is real interesting. It's real interesting. 138 is not just the Phoenix phenomenon number, but it seems to be a cap. It's intrinsically connected to the fine structure constant as well. So here's a 138 years after the flood in the year 2101 BC. Phoenix appears in the sky. This is the first visitation of Phoenix since Phoenix, the Typhon, destroyed the world in the great flood. Here it is 138 years later. It is 1,656 months after the destruction. Phoenix appears again, and it's seen in the sky. So the only thing really interesting about this is that I'm only mentioning it because the Chinese have a tradition but their tradition is 34 years off of this. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. The Chinese say that the sun darkened. And because it was so unexpected, the emperor, who didn't like the fact that the mandate of heaven had changed and he had not been warned, he executed the sky watchers. And it became a tradition ever after for emperors to execute any astronomers who could not accurately predict the darkening of the sun. So, uh, I find this interesting because the Chinese date for the Great Flood is 30 years off. 31 years off. The Chinese date for the Great Flood. It's off. So, I find it really interesting that the sun darkening of the Chinese sun darkening is 34 years off from this date right here. So I as this this is why it's the first time you're hearing this. I do not record this in my Phoenix in my Phoenix research. All my Phoenix research, I've never mentioned this to you. And I haven't done it because it does not qualify as evidence to me. It's only interesting. So remember, guys, my my own. My own standard is far in excess of even what academia holds for themselves. I do not go by plus or minus a single year in my research. I don't do it. Everything is exact. All my sources, people have bought those books and looked themselves, and those are the dates that are published. Those are the ones I provide. I, this right here is very interesting to me, and I'm probably right. It's probably the, the Chinese, this is probably it, but I just can't use it as evidence because all my data sets are designed, designed to be sealed tight. I want no room for argument. So anyway, 
It's just interesting. So we're going to the next year. The next year is 139 years after the flood, equal to our 1885 AD. This is the year 2100 BC. It's a general date assigned by scholars. Scholars are in agreement, Near Eastern scholars are in agreement that reliable dating of events of the Near East began at this point. Remember, it's just an overall. They always give themselves 100 or 100 years plus or minus. They give themselves like a 200-year window. So 2100 is, is, a, is a, they're nailing it because Near Eastern scholars don't even talk about the Great Flood. But here they are right here. 139 years after the Great Flood, their approximate date nails it. This is about the time when all the cities in the Near East started using accurate chronologies and accurate dating and all that, and that, that we, can, we can accurately date events based off these systems. This is pretty interesting. And they, they mentioned the Sumerian Babylonian king list, the Assyrian Lim, Limu list, the astronomical records, the Venus Almanacs, the Egyptian papyri, uh, different temple monumental evidences. So that's pretty interesting. I, 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 like, I, I liked when I read that because it just confirms that, yeah, okay, it's about 138 years, 139 years after a total systemic collapse that everybody's now woke up and moving, moving. So, 176 years after the Great Flood, equal to our 1848 A.D. What happened in 1848? Well, that's when the Communist Manifesto was, was written and published uh, by this Jewish guy and his other, his other Engels and, and oh, I can't remember the other guy. But anyway, uh Communist Manifesto pretty much outlined exactly how they were going to take over the world. And when you read the Communist Manifesto and you look at the world we're living in today, they succeeded. They did that. 176 years ago was 1848. 176 years after the Great Flood was the year 2063 BC. The first dynasty of Kish comes to an end. It's over. It's over. The first dynasty of Kish was 23 kings. According to the prism, it's 23 kings who ruled for 24,510 shars. That's evenings and mornings. So 24,510 shars is just 68 years. Divide, anybody can do it on your phone. Divide 24,510 divided by. 360 turnings of the stars per year. It's just 68 years. So it's perfect. It lines up with the archaeology. It lines it lines up exactly with what every other what a time keep, timekeeping system is demonstrating. But it also provides us a very valuable piece of information about the Akkadian kingship. Because 24,510 shars divided by the Sumerian sexagesimal year of 360 turnings of the stars is 68 years. And it means 23 kings each ruled for 1080 days apiece. Each one ruled for 1,080 days apiece. Where have we seen that number? Over and over and over. How many times have I shown you that number, 1080? Yep. So, Kingship here concerns, it's linked to the idea of the Great Pyramid. Right here, 1080. So, uh, it says right here that, that the uh, 24,510 shards reveals that the kings ruled for three years each, or 1080 days, with the 24th king having his rule cut off after 30 days. Wow. Guess what I have right here? The Shar is translated as, here's the Sumerian translation of the word Shar from this old book. Completed circle. That's it, guys. Nobody can say Shar means year. 
it's a unit of measurement. Yeah, so it applies to days, months, years, whatever. It's a unit of measurement. Shar is actually translated completed circle. That's amazing. Now, 227 years after the Great Flood is the year 2012 B.C. Now, we have Kronos. He begins to rule, and he takes his wife as Queen Semiramis. Kronos, this is Kim. This is the one. This is the one who violated his mother, the wife of Noah, Nema. Kronos begins to rule in 2012. His rule is very unpopular. Now, Kronos begins to rule at the long period of Titan history. Long period of Titan history, but he's the last of the Titans to rule. This is Kim. This is Kim, known as Ham, Kronos, all that. His wife is the young Queen Semiramis. Why is she unique? Because she's half Titanus, half giant. She's not just a giant. She's actually the daughter of Nema. Nema is a Titanus from before the flood. So we don't know who, who her dad is. We don't know who her dad is. This is really this is going to get really interesting because it is astounding who her son is. So it calls into question who her father is. Somebody else had sex with Nema other than Noah to produce Semiramis. Semiramis is not the daughter of Noah. The reason we know this is because the pedigree of Nemar Sin, also known as Amar Udaak in the Sumerian, later in the Akkadian, he is Merodak. It is condensed in Babylon to Marduk. In Hebrew, it is Nimrod. He started off as the mighty hunter before the Lord, but he grew to astonishing size. In the Sumerian records, his name was Bilgamesh. It was later mistranslated as Gilgamesh. This guy who ended up being a giant slayer and a ruler was also half. It's, it's, I'm going to show you the records but, uh, in my presentations, but he was he was considered to be half tight of Titan blood, but he was also a half giant. And this is exactly what we see on Akkadian reliefs. Naram Sin was tall, tall, he is taller than everybody else, wore a horned helm. But what's crazy about this is we have actual reliefs of him that show that he was a black man ruling over an Aryan society. I'm not making this up. This is real. It's not just it's not just from the artistic reliefs. But when I give you my presentation on the, on, the, on the king of the giants, the mighty hunter of world mythology on Nimrod, I'm going, to, I'm going to itemize all these ancient legends that talk about him. And in every one of them, he's black. He's the son of Queen Semiramis. Queen Semiramis is the daughter of... Is the Queen Semiramis is the daughter of Nema, the Titaness, but we don't know who the father is. It wasn't Noah. So we'll get to that. This is all amazing history, guys. And the amount of, I'm going to, just like I do with everything else, guys, I'm going to overwhelm you with the references and ancient texts that talk about this guy. This guy is amazing. It's amazing. His whole history is amazing. He, it was known he was a foreigner. It was known that he wasn't of the race that he ruled. All this was known. It's crazy. This, this is the story that, that became simplified as Nimrod, but it's actually the story of the Sargonid Epos. He, his, his, most famous, his most famous epithet was Sargon of Akkad. We'll get to it. Now, so in 2012, 227 years after the flood, by this time, guys, the flood is a world away. It is a memory. The world is now 227 years later. The world is teeming with people, teeming with people. 
Cities have been built. Infrastructure's laid. Some cities are already getting old. It's 227 years after the Great Flood. And the Great Flood still had millions of survivors. So we're dealing with a, po a very populated world. And we know this because the wars that are described at this time period in the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, in, in, in the battles of the Kur, etc., what, what is described in the Sumerian text, in the, in, in the, in the uh, 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 Sargon epos, we have these massive battles that are also chronologically dated for this period in the Book of Jasher. They're amazing, huge. There's so many people on the battlefield. So many people. The world is now packed and full of people and dynasties. And the history that I'm giving you now of Semiramis and Nema and Noah and Kim and Kronos, these are the survivors of whoever the elite were in the world before the flood. This is who they are. This is the story, the genealogy of the elite that survived that cataclysm. This is this is how the story is unfolding. 227 years ago in our calendar was 1797 AD. That was a long time ago. That was, a, that, was that was when our nation, the United States, or at least my nation, the United States, was in its infancy. Hell, we hadn't even secured it from England yet because we still had to fight the Battle of 1812. So, yeah, it's a uh, 227 years is a very long period of time for a lot of things. And remember, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. So I, I say this all the time. If, if I can show that something is true somewhere, then it's probably true everywhere. They already had some very unique technologies developing back then. So that's, two, that's 212. 212. 2012 BC, Kronos begins ruling over all the cities of the Tigris Euphrates Basin in Turkey, Turkey, Elam, all that, uh, northern Egypt. All that is being ruled by one man's empire, the empire of Kronos. This is the subject matter of the Theogony of Hesiod. This is when he talks about the end of the rule of the Titans. He took for his wife, Queen Semiramis, and she was a queen in Akkad before she ever inherited Babylon. His rule would last 65 years. Other names that he is known by, uh, he first of all, he was the enemy of Yapatos. Yapatos, you know of, is the son of, he's a titan. Uh, he's the son of Noah named Japheth. He's also the enemy of Shem. So uh, let's see, Shem became Melchizedek. That became his royal title after the flood. Shem was a priest, and he was a priest in Canaan, Actually, actually, Syria, where the most where the most holy of all cities in the ancient world was known to be. Whole wars were fought for the city, and it was not Jerusalem. Jerusalem was never important in the ancient world. It was always a small, insignificant city. It's not even on a trade route. The holy city of the ancient world that Shem uh, originally uh, took seat at. He was enthroned as a holy priest, uh, 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 and he was called Melchizedek which means the king of Zedek, that city was later called Kadesh. Kadesh was the holy city. It was the central center of worship and temple for even Bit Omri, the house of Omri. You know of them as the Omrides. The Old Testament calls them the Israelites. So this is a, a the, he's an enemy. He's an enemy of, of, of his name is Belus. In, in ancient traditions and records, Kronos was also known as Belus, Kim and Kronos, Ammon, Ammon and Annan. These are all ancient names that he was known by. He ruled for 65 years. This was the first year. He ruled for 65 years until he was violently deposed. And we'll get to that. He was, he was deposed in 1947 by, by Amar Udaak, Merodak, Marduk, Nimrod. So, uh, that was 1947, and he was deposed the exact same time, the exact same year that Brahma was born. Brahma is better known in the ancient records as Abram. So here we have uh, okay, we're gonna move on. 
Let's see here. All right. So, let's see. According to the early Greeks, the reign of Kronos was a golden age of peace and prosperity when people never grew old. It was the age of the Titans. All right. So, this is pretty much parallel to the genealogies of Genesis and Jasher. This is what we have. People born after the flood live for, live for at the most 400 years with human longevity declining rapidly afterward. If you notice in like the book of Genesis and, and in the book of Jasher, you will see that uh, all these patriarchs that, that started dying off, like Sarug, Peleg, uh, Shem died, uh, Noah died 350 after, years after the flood. Shem died, Melchizedek died in the 500th year after the flood. We ne we, 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 we've never been given a date for the death of Yapatos, uh, Japhath. We've never been given a date. He was a titan that was in, the, in war against Nimrod, though, in the Titanomachy. He may have died on the field of the, of the war of the titans and giants, which is shown on the Parthenon. As so the Parthenon, the Parthenon, all the art on the Parthenon, the Greek Acropolis of Athens, the, the, the uh, Titanomachy is just that. It is the war of titans and giants that is that was so venerated in the ancient world, which we're going to get to in a second. So let's move on. Check my chat again. Guys, I'm in rare form. I'm sorry, man. You're just going to have to deal with me tonight because I'm going, I'm going full tilt. We got a lot of ground to cover. Two hours and 19 minutes. Yeah, we still got more ground to cover. We're only we're only uh 239 years after the flood. We're going to 390 years after the flood to to a to an to an event that could have only happened. It was technology, it was a technological fallout. It was an absolute technological attack. But uh right now, 239 years after the flood is equal to our 1785. 1785. All right, so what happened here? Oh, uh, this is just a general date by, by Leonard Woolley. Some of you don't know, Woolley excavated many Sumerian sites, and he made some very interesting discoveries, such as is the oldest Sumerian tombs actually had the most sophisticated jewelry, articles of clothing, and 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 uh, dental uh, on skeletons and all that. And you realize, wow, they were long skulled. He, he, the skeletons were long skulled. Remember, I told you about vapor canopy. Vapor canopy, vapor canopy environment creates long skull. The longer a human lives in a vapor canopy environment, they got long skulls. He also noticed that the skeletons were large, way larger than the local populations of smaller people. So, this uh, uh, Wooly noticed that that the sophistication in the older tombs. Was, was there, and the newer crypts and tombs showed less and less quality of craft. This is exactly what you'll find in a systemic reset. It's exactly what you'll find. The survivors still had their rings, jewelry, pearl necklaces. They still had articles of clothing, and they died and were buried with those things. They died within 50 years after, after the Great Flood. They are buried and interred with their items. But the but the jewelers and the lapidaries and all the tradesmen that are that are still making things are not making them with the quality that existed prior to the cataclysm. This is exactly what Woolley Woolley and other archaeologists found. Things became more and more inferior with time. I find I find that that, that very fascinating. Uh, Woolley wrote. I quoted him. He says, "Oh." Uh, it is astonishing to find that at this early period, the Sumerians were acquainted with and commonly employed not only the column, but the arch, the vault, and the dome, architectural forms which were not to find their way into the Western world for thousands of years. Yeah. The reason that the oldest Sumerian cities in the Tigris-Euphrates Basin had these architectural features is easy for anybody who understands reset theory. It's because the long period of time necessary to acquire this level of achievement was experienced geographically somewhere else. Remember, I've told you guys, after the reset, they founded 
all these places in the Tigris Euphrates Basin, but the earlier Sumerian records describe an alpine region. They did not come from the valley there. They came from Turkey. They came from Armenia. They came, they came from those mountain ranges. That's where they come. And before that, they were living in the valleys of the Mediterranean. And the great flood wasn't the whole world. It was the Mediterranean because the pillars of Hercules broke. And when they broke, the Atlantic came rushing in. So this is what we have here. Nice little, nice little piece of archaeology there. Thank you, Thor Heyerdahl, for, for informing us of that little piece in your book, The Tigris Expedition. Shout out to Thor Heyerdahl. All right, let's see. All right, let's move on, guys. We got 17 people in the chat. That's 17 people listening. 1,700 people. That's great. Hey, man, this is this is a, this is fascinating. When I'm fascinated by a presentation, guys, you got to pay attention because this is going to get good. So we get to 252 years after the Great Flood. It's a whole other world. Most of the people alive now don't remember the great flood it's just a story they heard about it's like a bunch of us we don't remember the vietnam war it's just a story we heard about we don't remember the korean war it's just a story we we weren't alive during world war ii it's just a story of the past but right now in 2024 we would be looking all the way back to 1772 we would be looking back to a period before the boston tea party 1772 is 252 years ago. In that time, in our world, we've become not only technologically advanced, but hyper advanced. We're so advanced, we've gotten stupid. So this is the type of world we're here. We're looking at now. 252 years after the Great Flood was 1987 BC. Amar Udaak of the Sumerian text is born to Queen Semiramis, wife of Cronus. But Queen Semiramis cannot admit who she had sex with. Queen Semiramis cannot at all allow anyone to know that, that she, gave, she gave birth to this, this baby. This baby was a totally different skin color. This baby would have caused all kinds of problems. So what did Queen Semiramis do? She put him in a reed basket and put him on the Tigris River and floated him on the Tigris River. And this is what, what is preserved in what is called the Sargonad Epos. Sargon of Akkad was born, check this out, his mother was unknown. But we know, we know who it was, it was Queen, Queen Smyrmus. But his mother, in the text it says his mother was unknown. His father is unknown. He's trying to establish a, a, a divine pedigree. He says, he was put on a river in a reed basket, and he was rescued by an Inaitu priestess. And an Inaitu priestess took him in and raised him, and only later in life did Sargon realize that he was royal. He was of royal blood. Sargon of Akkad was a black man, and he was gigantic. And he was raised up by the priesthood initially, but he was too wild. And he ended up becoming a great hunter. And he ended up getting a very good reputation with the locals. And uh, he, he was believed to be a mighty hunter before the Lord. And he built altars and sacrificed animals. And this right here gave him a lot of clout with the people. And then he had a run-in with, with the sons of Yapatos, Japhat who were feared and regarded as titans. And because he overcame them, word of his valor spread all the way around. And now we have the story of young Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh of the Sumerian records, the wrestler who wrestled lions and, and animals and took, took as his friend in Kaidu, who was a wild man, probably autistic, but another half giant. But, saw, but uh, young, young Amar Udaak grew up and his skin, his skin was way darker than all the locals. This would have been 
someone who was supposed to be a eunuch in the in the palace of Semiramis, she was having sex with probably one of her servants or one of the soldiers, one of the soldiers from from another another group, race, culture. I don't know. I just know that we do not know who Semiramis' Samir, father was. We just know that her mama was Noah's wife, Nama. This made her of Titan pedigree and a half giant. But we don't know who the who, who the father of this of of we don't know who the father of Sargon was. It's a total mystery. But whoever he was, he was dark as hell, because he came out with real curly hair, real dark skin. His beard is real curly, and he he looks every bit as, he looks every bit as, as an American black man today. This is Sargon of Akkad, and the legends and the traditions all about him also claim that he was black. This isn't just an interpretation by looking at the bronze, the bronze uh, uh, busts that have survived from from Akkad. This is also in the legends and traditions, and there's a lot of them. We're going to get into those. Not in this presentation. We have a whole separate presentation on the life of Nimrod. But we're going to get into a bunch of this stuff right here, some of it. So this is 252 years after the Great Flood that Amar Udaak, who becomes Nimrod, he is born to Queen Semiramis. Uh, the wife of Kronos, 252 years uh, uh, after the flood, and this is also 828 years Anno Pyramid. Since the Great Pyramid was, was finished, it is two cursed Earth periods, 414 years plus 414 years. All right, so I think I got all notes to see. Got all the notes on that. All right. Also, by this time, remember, Nama has already given birth to Arba. Arba, by this time, has already fathered Anak. Anak, by this time, already has multiple sons who've had multiple sons. It's literally an entire race of giants, and they were called the Anakim at this time. They were already alive and thriving. They were, as a matter of fact, we have traditions where Nimrod considered the Anakim his uncles. So that was 200. So he was born 252 years after the Great Flood. So 20 years later, 20 years later is 272 years after the Great Flood. It is equal to our 1752 AD. For those of you who don't know, I, I have a video presentation on 1752 AD, and I, expl I explained that over Europe was seen a super construction that is described as an octagonal green star that had filled the sky and it gave off sparks and it lit fires all over Europe and it killed a lot of people. Uh, this is in the year 1752. It's, one, it's in one of my videos about super constructions hidden in our sky. So this is seven. This is that's that's what seven. That's what a 272 years is to us. It's all the way back to 1752. So 272 years after the Great Flood was 1967 B.C. Amar Udaak is now 20 years old when hostilities began with the Titans, the sons of Yapatos, Japheth, son of Noah. Remember, Noah is an Apishtim. He's the far away. He doesn't interfere anymore in the affairs of men. He's gone. Gilgamesh has to go a long journey into Syria to even to go find him in Lebanon just to go find him. So uh which is near Kadesh, the holy city, and where where Melchizedek, the son of the son of Noah, uh, ruled as a priest king. So this is 1967 BC. At 20 years old, uh at 20 years old, Amar Udaak received a relic from uh Kronos. Kronos gives Amar Udaak a goat's fleece. This goat's fleece, it, I don't know, this, this is the tradition, guys. I'm just, I'm just telling you. It's supposed to have come from before the flood, and it's supposed to give somebody divine protection. This is in the legends and traditions on the fleece. So the goat's fleece is given to, to young Nimrod, to, to, to Amar Udaak, Marduk, Mer Merodak. He gets it, and he suddenly he, he 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 like becomes invincible. He thinks he can't be killed, 
it's a lamb skin. It's called a lamb skin. It's called a goat. Uh, you know, in the traditions of the Hes of Hesiod and the Theogony, in the traditions of the Titan lore, it's called the Aegis. It's the it's the a it's the Aegis of Zeus. It's this protective goat shield that Zeus uses. Zeus Zeus is Amar Udak from a different culture. So, anyway, it was passed down, and and uh, uh, the Jews took that story. I'm just telling you what they did, guys. Don't quote me. The Jews took that story when they were when they when they were reviewing the Babylonian records and they were reviewing what was commiser commiserating with the Greek text and they saw wow the Titan the Titan legends and stories match everything we find from from these Babylonian libraries and all that well what they did is when the Jews wrote their rabbinical literature and they included themselves in historical narratives for which they did not belong, and they invented all these fantastic narratives. They claimed that Nimrod received the lamb skin that was actually killed by God in the Garden of Eden, and it was given to Seth, and Seth gave it, and Seth gave it to Enos, and Enos gave it to Mahalalil, and Mahalalil gave it to Lamech, and Lamech gave it to, to uh, his son Noah, and Noah had it on the ark, and it was preserved through the flood. And then after the flood, Noah gave it, gave it to, to Yapatos, Japheth, but, but uh, Kim, after he had saw his father's nakedness, after he had sex with his with his with his mom, he turned around and stole the Aegis and took it, and then it ended up it ended up given to Nimrod by the by the thief who was sitting on the throne, Kronos. So that that's that's the story, but that doesn't have we don't have that in the more in the most in the oldest traditions. We have that in the Jewish versions. Uh, rabbinical texts that that are you know, we have a lot of that guys. I don't even want to get into it. I it really disenchants people when they hear just how much how much how much fiction has been introduced into the rabbinical and biblical narrative that did not belong in the older texts. It, it, it gets it gets really discouraging when you start hearing it all. But anyway, this this is the story. Um, Nimrod, Amar Udak, he got that he got that goat uh, deal. He got the goat fleece, and the goat fleece imbued him with some type of divine protective power. And uh, he carried it with him everywhere, and it gave him the power to become the mighty hunter. And he, and he became known quickly, not just for hunting animals, he started hunting giants. Because by this time, now the giants were becoming a problem because they didn't go by, by the law codes. The law codes were implemented to keep the Lugalum in check. The Lugalum were the big men. And initially, the big men were praised. They were, might, have, might have been worshipped a little bit. They were called big brothers, which in Sumerian was an affectionate term. But it, it became something else. Now they're a problem. Humans have them outnumbered thousands to one. But they're still a problem because they're so damn big. And, and uh, it's just... This is this is the world 272 years after the flood. Now there's a lot of prejudice, but it's not racial. The prejudice is by the size of your body. Titans and giants had to go. So and this is we're gonna get into that now. Check my chat, make sure everything's going right. All right. Remember, guys, you, 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 giants didn't. Giants and titans did not come from angels having sex. This is all Jewish redacted inventiveness. It's not. Giants came from environmental changes. All right. Cool. Everything's going great. Now, so. Yeah, this is all. This is all the same story, guys. It's told all over the world. Uh, you can call it a, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can call it the Legends of Hercules. It's all the same story. Nimrod was raised was raised a shepherd, but he forsakes uh, this for a career as a hunter. He slays wild animals uh, that have multiplied far rapidly than mankind has, uh, and caused many problems uh, in the traditions after the flood. Animals multiply, uh, multiplied rapidly and humans didn't have the protections. And there are many stories and legends of children disappearing because wild animals got too close to the villages. And uh, 
And people like Nimrod were actually looked on looked on with praise. There were there were shepherds when they needed to be shepherds, but there were mighty hunters when they needed to be hunters because the uh, the uh, the predatory animals were real. They were a real problem after the flood. All right, so this is a. Uh, I have some notes here where different historians link the savior motive to shepherd because of this time period. It was this time period that it was this time period where shepherd over animals and the animals were used to clothe and feed the population. The shepherd had to become a mighty warrior because of the things he had to fight. The shepherd literally over over centuries, the shepherd became regarded as the savior. Then many centuries after shepherds were no, no longer needed because all civilizations were urban development was so great. They had whole herds inside walled cities and they had whole stone walls uh, protecting uh, uh, deals went, went centuries later shepherd had become the symbol for for a savior in, in this way so let's see all right now now we get to 276 years after the Great Flood. This is two Phoenix periods of 138 years plus 138 years. In our calendar today, it would be 1748 AD would have been the flood. And this is 2024. 1748 AD was 276 years ago. This is, in our study, 1963 BC. Typhon, the great red dragon, appears in the sky in Nimrod's 23rd year alive. Typhon appears in the sky, great dragon. We have we have the stars kind of the stars roll to temporal pole, pole shift. We have this story from the ancient world that Zeus, young Zeus battled Typhon uh, um, during the reign of Kronos. Uh, we have an old Greek tradition that claims Bacchus was preserved in a box on a river. He grew up and he had a rod that changed into a serpent. And he passed through a seabed when he needed when he needed to get to the other side and he held the serpent rod up and the ocean split in half. This is before Moses and the Exodus. This is the ancient Achaean legend of Bacchus. And Bacchus was put in a box and floated down a river. This is the Sargon epid, uh, uh, epos all over again. Bacchus traveled to India with an army in the light of the in the light of the sun. Suddenly appeared at nighttime. That's a pole shift. Bacchus touched the rivers Orontes and and what is it Hydespes Hydespes with his magic rod, and the waters flowed back to allow him passage. That's not what really happened. We already have. From the 1800s, we already have uh, 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 we have historical accounts from William Corliss that explained that in that a river in India backed up because of an earthquake, and for days people were allowed to walk on dry ground where they had never been allowed to walk before. And then three days later, or an earthquake, uh, another earthquake had the river coming right back to where it, where it was supposed to go. So that's not that's not unusual. It's also happened in Transjordan. Let's see. So it was thought that Bacchus arrested the course of the sun and the moon. Now, Bacchus was also a lawgiver. He had two tables of stone that was ancient, and he was anciently depicted as wearing horns. Guys, you are hearing things that sound like Moses, but you can't identify him with Moses because Moses is the Jewish version taken from Nimrod, Sargon, Amar Udaak, Bacchus. Her Heracles. All these are attributed attributed to them. So, uh, this, these were all older traditions that were laid. Remember, the Old Testament doesn't date back to 14, 14th century BC. In my own presentations and on my Dark Scriptures playlist, you'll see 100% fact after fact after fact after fact that the Old Testament only dates as early as 200 BC. It is a product of the Alexandrian Library. It's even mentioned in the apocryphal text as being written at the Alexandrian Library. So Alexandrian Library didn't even come into existence until after Alexander of Macedon was dead in 320, 325, 323 BC. So 
Det sa um, see. Yeah, so we have echoes of this in the Ramayana and in the Mahabharata. The same thing, this anomaly with the sun. But but Rama, Rama is no different than Nimrod. They're the exact same individual. Oh, I got me a refill, a refill dance. Thank you. It's gonna be a late one. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, y'all, y'all are in trouble. I got me, a, I got me some more coffee. No, you're in trouble. Whew. All right. So I lost my play. Okay. In the Vedic Ramayana, night suddenly turned into day. People in bed awakened at daylight. Astronomers bewildered fi finding burning lamps still full. So the sun became violent, then plunged and night returned. This is a temporal pole shift. This is what Phoenix is famous for. So at this time, the archaeologists have dated a Babylonian omen text, and it reads, if the sun comes out in the night and the country sees it light everywhere, there will be disorder in the country everywhere. It's pretty much common sense. So the Vedic Ramayana text preserves this Phoenix transit per perfectly. It's a Phoenix pole shift, and it was temporary, night suddenly turning into day which meant in the daytime in another hemisphere, it suddenly turned night and then it went right back. So, um, let's see. Rama of ancient India, an etymological artifact of Marduk. Rama and Ma Mar and Rama are the same. Remember I've told you guys how the Aryan is is the is the reverse of all the of all the other languages in the ancient world. It is the reverse. This is why we have things like like fiend in Greek, but it's Noth in Egyptian. This is why the Egyptian goddess Neith, just across the Mediterranean in the in the Indo-Iranian culture of Achaia, the Greeks, the Egyptian Neith now becomes a fiend. This is why it's reversed. We have hundreds of examples of words from the ancient world. They're identical. It's a mirror effect. And it's because some, some of these cultures wrote from left to right and others wrote from right to left. And this is, this is why this was produced. We, you even find it in the names of cities. But we have, we have Mardon, Marduk, Amar Uda'ak, Merodak, Nimrod, all, pre, all preserve the Semitic Mar. But in the Aryan, it's Ram. It's Rama. It's the exact same. The Ramayana is a story about young Nimrod when he was when he was good and holy at first. So uh, let's see. Rama is King Ravana's enemy. This being the Kronos, Ham of Genesis, Kim, Kronos. So uh, Ravana was cursed. There it is again. That's, a pr that's proof right there. We know he's cursed. He had sex with his mom. As Ravana was cursed in the Ramayana reading at his, at his Ravana, remembering an ancient curse that if he touched a woman without her consent, he would die. There you go. The Indian Vedic Ramayana text is about young Nimrod when he was good. And young Nimrod was against Kronos, who was ruling on the throne. He had not yet deposed him. Remember, this is all going, going toward the deposing of Kronos, the last of the Titans. So there it is, Ramayana. Confirm that right there, what Genesis said. <clears throat> So, uh, Ravana kidnap also kidnapped a woman named Sita, a woman also who went by the name of Yanaka, whom, Ra whom Rama loved. So, Nimrod was in love with this girl named Yanaka. Here it is in the Ramayana. Her name is Yanaka. And I, in my notes, I put, she is none other than the sister of Anak. 
a son of Noah born after the flood. She would later be called Semiramis. Remember, in the stories, Nimrod did the same thing that he deposed Kronos for. Kronos had sex with his mother, Nama, a titaness. Then he takes Semiramis as his wife. Semiramis is the mother of Sargon. Sargon is, is Rama. Sar Sargon is, is Amar Udak. It's all the same person. But here it is many, many years later. He wants as queen, because she's of Titan blood, she is the elite of the elite. She is married to his enemy. But she's his mom. He turns right, and this is what this is why this is why Nimrod later assumed the curse of Kronos. He was cursed too, because he took his own mama as his wife, as his wife when he began to rule Babylon. Yeah, this that's where this is all leading. Nimrod becomes king, and the title they give him is Amraphel. For any of you, any of you out there that can translate Semitic, you'll find out that Amraphel comes from the Hebrew words that he has fallen. He's fallen from his first estate. He did this, Amra, he becomes Amraphel because he does the same thing he, he, that uh, he, he uh, deposed Kronos about. So anyway, he takes it, he takes it, he takes his, uh, his own mom as his wife on the throne. Whether he did anything with her, I don't know. I don't know. But she outlived his ass anyway. Let's see. Um, all right, cool. 1963 BC. So, uh, Young Nimrod, we have a Phoenix episode in Young Nimrod's life. I have a whole lot more notes on it, but we're, we're, we need to run out of time. We need to keep going. So, the Phoenix episode that is mentioned in the Babylonian records is, is confirmed in the uh, uh, Ramayana and in the Greek stories of Bacchus who was also a baby, put in a basket, thrown on a river, just like Moses. He also had a staff with a serpent, and he raised it up, and water was split so he could walk on dry ground, just like Moses 700 years later. So 292 years after the Great Flood, 292 years after the Great Flood is 1947 B.C., and the Titans the sons of Yapatos and all their allies, the and the giants that are them, they have a battle and they are defeated. Twenty. This is the twentieth year of a conflict uh, between the Babylonian Assyrian cities, Akkad, Akkad and uh, uh, Japheth. And J you understand J the Japhethites were in the west, so this would have been like the cities of Bashan in Syria, which were giant cities that are mentioned later in the Old Testament. So uh, 1947 BC is the 20th year of a conflict and Nimrod is involved in that and he helps defeat the sons of Yapatos. And in the Greek text, the sons of Yapatos are all titanic. They're all huge, they're giants. So the purge has already begun. The pur and the purge is real. As, you're, as we're gonna find, the purge is even mentioned in Genesis. The very first invasion, the very first war ever mentioned in the entire Bible is in Genesis. In Genesis 14, it is specifically a purge against giants. Genesis chapter 14. Now, <clears throat> 292 years after the flood would be our 1732 AD. 1732 AD is a long time ago. Let's see, maybe the uh, the Inigo Jones document, one of the very first Freemason doc documents, talks about the Great Pyramid, Abraham and Enoch. Uh, 1732, uh, generally around the time of of like the Freemason Freemasonic Constitution. 1732, the Jones manuscript. That's a long time ago, guys. 292 years. Remember, it only takes 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. So in 292 years, we're, we're, we now have things going on. These, these battles and this, the stuff that's going on has come through the filter of multiple resets over thousands of years, meaning we're still thinking they're fighting with spears, so, swords, uh, 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 shields, and all that. But you know what? The, the type of weapons in their warfare could have been far more sophisticated. 
could have been much more sophisticated because we're going to come into contact with something that just blows your mind. And we all, I'm already glossing over a bunch of legends and traditions that infer technology just to get this chronology out. So this isn't a four hour video, but this is 292 years after the flood, 1947 BC, the Titans are defeated and Nimrod, Amar Udaak becomes Merodach. He sits on the throne of, of Akkad. As soon as he sits on the throne of Akkad, a priest, a seer named Anuki, which is an abbreviated Anunnaki, Anuki approaches the king and tells him, as soon as he's enthroned, that there's a prophecy against him. When he when he was enthroned, he castrated, he castrated Kronos because Kronos castrated Uranus. Uranus was castrated because every child he had was a titan. Kronos was castrated because he murdered every single child. And Nimrod was one of those children who was supposed to be murdered, but his mama switched out the babies. Another baby died, but he survived. But he had to, he had to get hidden. The switch out may not have been to save his life. The switch out may have been to save her life because he was a black baby. Yeah, guys, this is Sar. This is the history of Sargon of Akkad, Nimrod, Amar Udaak, Merodak, Marduk. It's all the same individual. So. This, uh, <clears throat> he comes back and kills uh, Kronos, takes Kronos' wife, Semiramis, and now Nimrod is on the throne of Akkad, and his queen, Semiramis, is of titan blood. She is of the blood of the elite of the elite of the pre-flood world, and she's his mother. Now, that's his queen. This is 1947 uh, B.C., Merodach is enthroned, and the other thing that happens is Anuki approaches him and gives him and gives him a, a prophecy and tells him that that there's going to be born that year. The stars the stars claim that someone has been born in Akkad right now, who, if left alive, will grow up and take his throne. And, and uh, no, no, excuse me, excuse, excuse me. Somebody who's going to grow up in his seed. Will over will, will overthrow you. That was the prophecy. It's exactly what happened. So uh Abram was born, Brahma was born. Later, later Brahma would get with Saraswati. Uh, you know the story. Brahma and Saraswati are from the ancient Aryan, the, the ancient, the ancient Indian Sanskrit Vedic stories. Uh, they got there's a lot of confusion about about these because we're looking through the lens of several resets, but Brahma. We know that Abram, and I, I've showed this, I don't have the book with me right now, but my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, has whole sections where I cite all these ancient texts that, Ab that Abram went to Egypt and studied the Great Pyramid. He went to the priestly colleges of Egypt and taught them the, the, how to translate the writings of Toth. Uh, he taught them the plans with numbers. Abraham, Abraham, I mean, Abram was schooled in the house of Ernos. Before Adnapishtim died, he took a student. Adnapishtim is Noah. Uranus is Noah. He's been castrated. He's living alone now. Well, he's no longer with Nama. Nama's a titanist, and she's promiscuous, and she's just out doing whatever she's doing. That's Semiramis's mama. So now Noah has become the far away in Sumerian. That's Adnapishtim. He's the old Atrahasis survivor of the flood. He's the, he's the air, he's basically the Indo-Iranian patriarch and he has all this knowledge and Abram as a young boy is smuggled to his house. Abram is right after Abram is born, he's raised in the house of Uranos and Uranos teaches him all the pre-flood knowledge, teaches him how to translate, teaches him all these wisdom from the antediluvian world. This is the story we get in the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees and the rabbinical writings, that there was a period of time when the one of the last titans, Noah himself, bestowed all his knowledge and wisdom on Brahma, which has come to us as Abram. But it's Brahma and Saraswati are the original names, and they were Vedic. Only later, when the Jews wrote the Old Testament based off Babylonian records, they changed it to Abram and Sarai, or Sarah, 
but the originals were Brahma and Saraswati. And Brahma had four faces. Why? Because the Great Pyramid that he studied had four faces that were known in the ancient world. These four faces of Brahma were once underwater, under the ocean, in the Vedic text. And all that's, all that's understood. The Great Pyramid was underwater in the ancient text. There's so much crossover about the altar of Agni. And the only problem is, is people who study the Rig Veda and the Atharva Veda, and they go through all, all the Puranic commentaries, they have this idea that all this knowledge belongs only to India. And it doesn't. India happened to preserve what had formerly belonged to a whole nother area of the world. Same thing with the Sumerian. People who, people who study Sumerian and, and, and they read Zechariah Sitchin, and they read all, all these monographs that, that, that are published by archaeologists, and they, they automatically think, well, everything in the Near Eastern text concerns the Near East. It does not. Archaeologists have identified whoever wrote most of these texts, these stories were somewhere else in the world. Same thing with the Aryan text that ended up in India. They're talking about the Egyptian pre-flood civilization. This is what I show in my book, Law Scriptures of Giza, and all through Chronicon. It's all here and it's all laid out. Let me. I have some. I have some citations from Vedic records that confirm this as well. But this is 292 years after the Great Flood, which is exactly what Flavius Josephus told us 2,000 years ago. He said that Abraham was born in the 292nd year after the Great Flood. That's what we have right here by, by a totally different species of, of, of analysis. So, uh, let's see. According to, according to uh, uh, Rashi, his name, his, oh my God, Rabbi Shlomo Yitshaki. That's a hell of a name there. 1,000-year-old commentary dates dates the birth of Abraham in the 292nd year after the flood, which would be equal to our 1947 B.C. Now, biblical chronologist Stephen Jones, in his book, The Secrets of Time, who does not cite any of that, he, he cites only the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees, the Old Testament, and the Assyrian eponyms. Using those four sources, he determined that, that Abraham was born in 1947 B.C. The book is called Secrets of Time. Uh, M.M. Noah wrote that an accurate accounting of Abraham's life reveals that he must have been born in 1948 Annus Mundi, which is exactly 1947 B.C. There's, they, they meet. The, Anomini, the, 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 the Annus Mundi calendar and the B.C. calendar both meet at 1947-48 right here. There's an overlap. Remember, there's a there's an overlap, guys, with January and February being the 11th and 12th months. All right. So anyway, there's a there's a lot. I have I have I have a lot of sources. I mentioned them in one of my YouTube channels. I read every source showing that Abraham was born 1948 BC because that's how you perfectly date the Exodus, which is 1447 BC. So after 20 years of strife and fighting with the Titans called the Yap, uh, the sons of Yapatos the Japhethites of Noah, the Hamites, or, or the, the sons of Kim, who were also Titans, uh, uh, were led in a, the, an assault was led by young Nimrod. And uh, let's see, during the battle, a sudden earthquake appeared. This is the Phoenix phenomenon deal I was telling you about. And the, and the Japhethites were overthrown in battle. So, so this story is very old and recorded in the book of Jasher. However, we have confirmation of this story in the ancient Greek account of Hesiod in his Theogony when an earthquake, howling winds, and a heat wave afflicted the Titans when they were banished by Zeus. Remember, Zeus is a young Nimrod. Zeus's career to the Greeks absolutely mirrors the Semitic stories of Nimrod. Ham, Kim, Kronos is dethroned after ruling for 65 years, according to the chronologies available to Augustine over 16 centuries ago, as he recorded in his book, The City of God. All right, Merodach, Nimrod, is chosen as king, and he castrates his grandfather, who is, who is Kronos, as a judicial act for violating Nema in 2235 BC. 
exactly 288 years prior. 144 plus 144 years. All right. Let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Then I have, okay, then Nimrod commits an act incurring the, the wrath of God when he castrates the holy patriarch Titan Noah. I'm sorry. Earlier I said that that uh, uh, Kronos had done that, but no, it was Nimrod that castrated uh, 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 Kronos and and Noah. I have, that's right, because that's right, because Noah was still having sons and daughters. They were still having Titans. So Nimrod, being the giant slayer, now he castrates. He castrates Noah. And it says here that this was not a judicial act, but it was done out of fear. Noah's sons were gigantic, the Anakim, who were banished to the West. We have that in the Greek stories too. Uh, this banishment to the West is a major theme of the early Greek traditions of the sons of Deucalion, the Greek Noah called New Wine Sailor. The Anakim travel to the far west to build for themselves the mighty Mycenaean uh, culture, erecting the famous Lion's Gate Fortress. Nimrod feared that the ever virile Noah from before the flood would keep impregnating concubines and fathering these immense people. Other races of giants that were feared were the Rephaim, the Emums, the Zuzums, and the Zamzumums. All of these races are mentioned in the Old Testament records in Genesis chapter four, 14. Some Anakim settle in Canaan. Then Nimrod, once he secures his realm, marries his own mother, the tall and beautiful Semiramis. Wow, the daughter of Nama. Okay, now in my notes, I don't remember where I got this from. I'd have to go deeper into my... I have a whole file on Nimrod. It says, this was not an ancestral move but on Nimrod's part, but a political one. And that could be true. He may, he may have never had sex with his mom. Not like his, not like his dad did. Oh, it very well, it very well could have been, it very well could have been a, just a political move because she was like the elite of the elite in her bloodline. She was a titaness. All right. So, uh, as a matter of fact, in the ancient Near East, imperial power descended through the female line only. There are many texts that read that a king ruled, quote, as the son of the great mother. All right, so well, we have a window here that in the days of Nimrod, this is when the shift began to patriarchy. Remember, the Great Flood just didn't end the matriarchal power of the pre-flood world. It, it, evidently, it continued. We don't have a shred of evidence here that the matriarchy was weakened by the Great Flood. It seemed it seemed to be weakened centuries afterward, because the patriarch the patriarchy may have really really set in and begun with Nimrod's rule, because of all the things he begins to do. There's a whole list of trespasses this dude's done. This guy's done. So let's see. Now, of all the races that are mentioned in the Old Testament records, some Anakim settle in the land of Canaan. I've already, I've already got that. I'm sorry. All right. All right. The first regnal year of Nimrod, he is called Amar Udaak. We already know that's just Sumerian. In, uh, Sumer in Sumerian, Amar Udaak is the same thing as Akkadian Merodach. It's the same thing as Babylonian Marduk. Same thing as Hebrew Nimrod. They're all the same. Let's see. Relying on older chronologies available to him, Augustine wrote in the City of God that Abraham had been born about tw the 1200th year before Rome was founded as it were, another Babylon in the West. This is interesting because he only offered an approximate, and yet he's only six years off. And he's talking about a 12th century period. That's, that, that's awesome. Chronologically, that's, that's amazing. 
All right, so we move on. Check my chat again. Oh, I'm glad y'all hanging with me. We lost about 100 people. We lost about 100 people. I guess it got too late for them. Friday night got too hot. I get it. I get it. All right. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, let's see. 302. Remember, we're going 390 years after the flood. 302 years after the flood is equal to our looking back from 2024 to the year 1722. 1722 AD. I'm talking about piracy was rampant. Pirate ships are out there fighting, fighting the British, the British Royal Navy out there, out there fighting the the uh, American schooners and fishermen and all that. 1722. This is what's this is what's going on. 302 years ago. 302 years after the Great Flood is 1937 BC. Abram is 10 years old when he is taken out of hiding and sent to the house of Noah. So at his birth, the court astrologer saw a strange star and determined that the ch that a child had been born whose seed would overthrow King Amar Udaak. The child was found to be that, that of General Terah. Terah's name is the origin of the little statues that you put in your windows for protection called Teraphim in ancient Babylon. He was a general in the Babylonian uh, military. So Terah took his took it took his child he took the child of a maid servant and, and brought the child to Amar Udaak and Amar Udaak killed the baby thinking it was Terah's son. But Terah had taken the child of a maid servant and paid her for it and then turned around and sent his own son to the house of Noah, one of the last titans. So Abram begins a 30-year study under the ancient Titan Noah, who was now 902 years old, learning the pre-flood histories, sciences, the mysteries, and the elder faith, as well as the prophecies of Adam, Seth, and Enoch. Noah taught Abram the secrets of Akuzan, which is the great pyramid complex in Egypt, and the ancient patriarch taught Abraham how to translate the pre-flood script. The Great Pyramid at that time was underwater in the southern Mediterranean, where the Egyptian Delta lies today, and would remain there until 1899 BC. So Abram is learning about this holy place, but it's underwater, except for the two, the two, two, two tallest pyramids. Every bit, of, every bit else is underwater, and the only Egyptian cities that are inhabited are Upper Egypt, which is deep Africa. Lower Egypt is all underwater, where the pyramids are. All right, so 320 years after the Great Flood, it's a whole other world. There's a, there, the 90, 99% of everybody alive, the Great Flood is just a story in the past, 320 years earlier. 320 years from today is 1704 AD. It's a long time ago. So in our narrative here, 320 years after the Great Flood is 1919 B.C. Amar Udaak, Nimrod, began an architectural project, a tower ziggurat that would later be remembered as the Tower of Babel. But already circulating at this time was a more ancient story when the gods stopped an architectural project that had been built by the ancestors and when... and. Uh, it had come to a complete stop and it was never finished. And we know this is true because the Great Pyramid has never been given a capstone. And for those who don't know, in the Near East, there are a series of tablets that have always been very enigmatic. But we have the seven kings mentioned over and over and over in all these different Semitic records, these Semitic Babylonian and Assyrian records. But we also have a series of, of texts that talk about the seven builders, the seven builders who had built the walls of Uruk, the seven builders who had laid the foundations of Babylon. And 
Remember, the Great Pyramid was this great structure. It was the original Tower of Babel. The Great Pyramid was never finished. Remember, the stone uncut by human hands is the stone the builders rejected. It's the chief cornerstone. It's called the head of the corner, and it was never added. That monument, that structure was never finished. So here we have, in, in remembering the stories of his childhood and, and, and about before the flood when the superstructure was built, but it wasn't finished. Here we have Amar Udaak wanting to build his own. So he builds this huge structure. Remember, tower was the ancient name for pyramid in the old world. We had even Cholula, even in the ancient Americas, they didn't call them pyramids, they were towers. So they built this tower in Babylon, which would have been a huge superstructure like a ziggurat. And they build this tower, and in the 20, it takes 20 years before something happens, and we'll get to that in a minute. But can, there were so many hundreds of thousands of people on building projects, and this is the numbers that were given in these records. It's amazing how what the populations were of the Near East at this time. And the Book of Jasher talks about these populations as well. These huge battles of 150,000 people on one side, 305,000 on another side, it's amazing. And it's just the world was teeming with people, and that's only because they had perfected the canal works. They had perfected the cereals, the grain, the agriculture. They were able to feed large groups of people with minimal work. So this uh, uh, Amar Udak, Nimrod, he's building this structure. And for 20 years, they're building the structure, and it got to the point where humans were not worth anything. In the stories that have passed down to us about the structure, it is said that, that, that when a man was given a brick, it was just enough weight for him to carry, but it would take him all day to get to the top and the scaffolding and all that and deliver it. And if the brick fell, they killed the man. If the man, if the man fell, others would reach out and try to grab the brick, but they wouldn't grab the man. They would just let him free fall. The bricks were important. The people weren't. Now we get to 324 years. The, the Tower of Babel is being built. 324 years after the Great Flood is the year 1915 BC. It is equal to our year 1700 AD. If we were to look back 324 years, it would be 1700 AD. So it's a long time ago. 1915 BC. This is the first appearance of the Nemesis X object in 732 years. The Nemesis X object uh, appears in the sky, and it now begins its 60-year journey across the sky. Remember, it moves very slowly. It stays up there for long periods of time. And in the ancient world, there was interaction between the Anuna on the ground and those in the Nemesis X object. The Nemesis X object has its, has its infrastructure and technology intact. It's the ones on the surface that lose everything in these resets. So the Nemesis X object has appeared. And with it, there's a total dynamic change to culture and society. We're going to get to that in a minute. So, uh... Interesting, this is 1,188th year of the Vedic calendar. Why is that important? Because it's the number 108 times 11. 11 is the number of the Anunnaki. It's found everywhere. In, uh, there's, it's found so much in Zechariah Sitchin's material. It's in the Enema Elish, the Babylonian Enema Elish. There are 11 facets of Tiamat. It's, 11 is the number of the Anunnaki. And here we find it in the Vedic calendar, in the ancient Aryan Vedic calendar the holy number of 108 times 11 is the exact year the Nemesis X object appears in the sky. It is also the exact year of 900 since the Great Pyramid was completed in 2815 BC without the cornerstone uh, uh, put, on, put on it. This is 324 years after the flood. Why is that relevant? Because it's 108 times 3. Why is the Great Pyramid relevant? Because the Great Pyramid was finished in 1080. I mean, 1080 Annus Mundi, which is 2815 BC. 1080 is 108 times 10. So remember, calendars are always self-referencing over and over and over, especially with cross calendrical parallels. We, all, we, we can always date things by the associations we find in other calendars. 
It's a, it's amazing. You guys have seen hundreds of examples of that. So, uh, yeah, this is 1188 of the Black Age, the Kali Yuga. Nemesis X appears. Okay, in this year, the Babylonians recorded a great blackness that swallowed the stars, a dark god from below that they called Tiamat, a sky dragon with seven heads that the Egyptians and later Greeks uh, called Typhon. All this is mixed up in the traditions. Appeared in this year of uh, uh, 1915 BC. So it says that uh, Typhon's arm, it's not Typhon though, guys, but you got to remember, Many times they confused them in ancient times because they were actually considered as siblings. Typhon's arms stretched a hundred leagues in either direction, and instead of hands, he had serpent's heads. His head touched the stars, and his vast wings darkened the sun while flaming rocks hit the ground. The legend of Typhon, Nemesis X object, actually provides more evidence, evidence uh, uh, of memories of Phoenix mixed in with, with Tiamat. In the myth of Typhon, the monster in space has a sister also connected to the darkening of the sun, another monster named Delphine, which preserves the root in Phoenix and Delphine is D-E-L and then Fiend. But in Hesiod's Theogony, preserves this event as occurring a short time after Zeus, Nimrod, conquered the Titans, the sons of Iapetos, and the Anakim. Hesiod wrote, that Typhon appeared in the sky with strange heads, which is an old designation for comets with black tails. The dragon heads gave off flames and vibrated the earth with noises as mountains trembled. Thunderbolts struck the earth as, as waters boiled until a fiery hurricane was born. The disaster concluded with a powerful lightning bolt flashing between earth and Tiamat which gave rise to the innumerable legends of a hero god who slew a sky monster. Remember, in ancient Babylon, the patron, the patron god of Babylon was Marduk. What did Marduk use? He used the labrys, which is the spear, the lightning spear, and he slew Tiamat. It's one of the most popular stories out of ancient Babylon. All right. Okay, moving on, moving on. I got a whole lot of notes here. I'm trying to trying to go through the notes without not going too much. You got to read the full Chronicon. There's a lot more here information here. I'm just skimming through it. Okay. So in, in Bacchus' account of the early Greeks, which is a memory of Nimrod, we find the same fact preserved as detailed in the Ramayana. During Rama, Bacchus, Nimrod's life, there occurred two unusual celestial events. And that's exactly what I just showed you guys. 1963 BC, the phoenix appeared. And it was it's in the Ramayana. And then after that, also in Rama's life, which is Nimrod, also in his life is this event here, Nemesis X object. So already, already in the 272 years after the Great Flood, we have the phoenix has made another appearance. Nemesis X object has made another appearance. And you guys are going to find that the dark satellite is about to make an appearance as well. Let's see here. All right. Okay, moving on. So, <clears throat> Nimrod as king is the hunter, a renowned warrior and a wrestler. He's Gilgamesh. A lawgiver, Hammurabi, Amraphel, and a king. A dispute with Noah's sons, the Titans, the Anakim, 10 years earlier, now has Amar Udaak on the throne, boasting that he defeated the Anunnaki themselves. themselves. The historic records from the Near East reveal that Sargon I, Sarg the Sargon is, is Amar Udaak, this is Nimrod, claimed to have vanquished the seven kings renowned from pre-flood antiquity. This guy is really boasting now. Later, Amar Udaak would assume the title Amurabi. Amurabi is his Amorite title. This is when the Amuru appeared and they became a part of his kingdom and they gave him a new title and they brought him an army. This is in the historical record. 
This is how he, his, his kingdom was saved after a military defeat. And, and Amraphel became Amarapi, which is Hammurabi. And, uh, and Hammurabi would then claim to have defeated the seven sages, the same as the sa seven builders. So these are dynastic claims made to secure his rule over the people. Let's see. For these claims, many groups splintered away, knowing him to be dishonest and an enemy of God. In the early Americas, Nimrod is remembered as the giant killer named Glooscap, also called the Liar. The belief the people had in Nimrod led to a further abomination. Many people now venerated Nimrod's mother and wife, the beautiful and tall Semiramis, daughter of Nema, the Titanus. She, she is now, now being regarded as a, a living representation of the goddess. Her brothers were the Anakim, called the Titans in, in Greek lore. Remember, even though his enemies are the Anakim giants that were fathered by the Titan Noah, remember I've already revealed to you guys, Amar Uda'at considered the Anakim, even though they were his enemies, they considered them, he considered them his uncles. Why? Because they were the brothers of Semiramis, the Titanus. So this is a, see these are all in the notes. All right. So we get to 340 years. We get to 340 years after the Great Flood. In our calendar, 340 years ago was 1684. It's another world away. It's a whole world away. Long time ago, 1684. So this is 340 years after the Great Flood, the day the sky fell, the collapse of the vapor canopy. 1899 BC, the dark satellite appears before they could finish the Tower of Babel project in a, in a flux tube blast. A plasma bolt comes from the sky, hits the ziggurat, melts the top of it, shatters all the bricks out, kills thousands and thousands of people. Major earthquakes, the sky darkens, uh, darkens, and something unusual happens that's only attached to the dark satellite. When the dark satellite appeared in 713 BC, it brought fundamental changes to our world. I have a video that goes into detail about this, and my published books go into a lot more detail. But in 713 BC, the ancient, the the ancient calendars that we all that that all the whole world went by was a 360 turnings of the stars calendar. It was 360 days a year. But then something happened, and the sun stopped moving across the sky. Then it went retrograde 10 degrees then it stopped in the sky again then it retraced the 10 degrees that it had lost and then continued on its journey and on the other side of the world they claimed they lost 20 hours of night or, or the night it was it was nighttime for 20 hours so 713 bc all of a sudden the year changed because 5.24 days were added to every year, and it changed every calendar and timekeeping system in the world. So I have three, um, three amazing data sets. One of them is that the whole world only knew a 360-day year. Second data set is, is something very unusual happened in the year 713 BC. And the third data set is that every, every calendar in the world changed it to the calendar we have today, which is 365.24 years uh, days a year. In 713 BC, in the narratives that we find in like the Apocalypse of Barak text, it says that, that when this happened, and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were vaporized in their armor, when this happened, God released evil angels among the, among the populations of the world, and they went out and executed vengeance on all kinds of things. This is really weird. Evil angels are released all over the surface of the world to do all kinds of things while this object appears in the sky and, and it makes the sun go erratic and all that. Changes the calendar. So the dark satellite introduced a fundamental edit to our reality. It changed the amount of days in the year. And it was accompanied by the release of evil angels. Well, the dark satellite, according to Charles Burgoyne in the 1880s and his mystic occult records, he claimed that the dark satellite contained 
evil ancient ones, gods that ruled before the flood that are that are hoping to come back and finish their reign over humanity. And this is exactly what we find in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we find that the seven kings are really a, are eight kings, but one of them is imprisoned, Apollyon, in, uh, in the deep. The other ones are imprisoned on the dark satellite. And any time the dark satellite comes close to us, those seven kings are so powerful they can affect things on earth, even though they're still imprisoned and can't get out. And in my other presentations, I've revealed to you guys, I showed you, man, the Statue of Liberty is not a female. The Statue of Liberty is a polyon. It, it, it is a male. And its, it's ankle is chained because a polyon is in the abyss chained. This is what the whole seven seals are about. The breaking of the first seal was about Apollo Pharmakia attacking the human family as a sacrifice to Apollo. So this is this is a, a this this dark satellite is scheduled to return in 2052. I've showed the chronology in my published books. In 713 BC, it did what it did. It was seen as a as a dark black javelin in the sky in the year 76, and it literally started the Saka calendar. And then we have the uh uh. It's returning in 2052, which is 168 years after the Statue of Liberty was erected outside of New York and dedicated. Those 168 years are represented in the chronometry of, of the Statue of Liberty, which has a circular staircase that goes up 168 steps to the torch. The symbolism here is very, is very reminiscent of the Great Pyramid, which is also a, a chronometrical calendar, which I've demonstrated. One hundred and In the 168th year of the Statue of Liberty chronometrical prophecy, liberty will be taken from the earth. This is 2052. It is the return of the dark satellite. In the, in the second Esdras prophecies and in the book of Revelation, we find out what? What happens when the seven kings return? What happens during the, the dark part of the beast kingdom tribulation? Evil angels are released on the earth. So all this is we've already discussed, but now I need to explain to you what happened in 1899 BC. Evil angels are what we call a phenomenon that is passed down through multiple, multiple filters of resets. But when the dark satellite appeared in 1899, something that was released that killed a bunch of people and they were regarded as angelic, meaning they were intelligences and they could fly. And they came and they killed a whole bunch of people and they stopped that whole, they put that whole project to, 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 to a stop. And this isn't just being made up. The ancient texts tell us that when the Tower of Babel was destroyed, a third of the people who were, were on it were basically murdered and evil angels were released among, among the populations. This is, this is too coincidental. Every time this object appears, the dark satellite, it does these edits. But the biggest edit it did in history period was not the change of the calendar. It was what happened as a result of this editing. It appeared and edited our reality and in an instant took a single language and, language and created so many that they couldn't ever get, get along anymore. Let's read what the historical record says. Now, while this was happening and the dark satellite was here, the whole, the whole entire shelf of North Africa in an earthquake raised back up another 200 feet and it drained the Mediterranean. It created the nine bows with the nine rivers coming off the Egyptian, the Nile, not, not, uh, all the way back to the head, which was where the Great Pyramid is. And it revealed the top, the top of the neck of the Sphinx sticking out the, 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 it's not the head of the Sphinx, the neck of the Sphinx sticking out the sand. And then the two pyramids half buried covered in seashells, just like Frederick Norton Lewis found them. It said, oh, this is, um, uh, in Egypt, from that day forward, for at least two centuries, was not called Gopt. It wasn't called Egypt. It was called the Raised Land. This is uh, this all happened in this year. At the same time that Nimrod's pyramid was destroyed by an object in the sky, the ancient pyramid built by the Sethites before the flood came rising up out of the ground. The four faces of Brahma, the great Veda that is covered in knowledge, Veda means altar, 
Remember in the book, remember I've told you guys in my published books, in ancient times, the Great Pyramid was revered as what? An altar in the land of Egypt. Yeah, it all makes sense, guys. We're, we'll get to it. we got more, more to show you here. So, um, a evil angels were released and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Um, what else do we have here? Even the Cholulu Pyramid in Mexico has a, has a tradition attached to them that it was destroyed in a cataclysm, but seven giants survived. One giant designed an artificial mountain, Cholulu Pyramid. There it is, the, the whole seven, the seven builders all over again. There it is. And in the, in the Mexican version, it says that the gods were angered from the sky and they destroyed the builders and the building and the language was confounded. Okay, this is the editing I'm talking about. In the book of Revelation, time, time is changed again. Remember, in the, in the, in the, not in the apocalypse period, which is the unveiling, when all truths are known, the apocalypse. The tribulation period is the first trumpet, then the second trumpet, third trumpet. In these trumpets, you learn that God is going to remove one-third of the sun, one-third of the moon, one-third of the stars, one-third of the day, one-third of the night. He mentions all five. All five are going to be reduced by, by a third, leaving 66.6% .6 behind. This is interesting. That's an editing process. He's going to change the day from 24 hours to 16 hours. He's going to change the year from 365 days to 243 days. That's amazing. That's a total edit of reality. And it's done to keep them from the evil to come or no flesh would be saved. It's done to abbreviate time. That's an edit by the dark satellite. The year was changed in 713 as an edit. And now here's another edit. This universal language that was spoken prior to this event is mentioned in the old Sibylline oracles in several passages in ancient texts found in cuneiform, as will be shown in, the, in, this, in this list right here. Once upon a time, the whole universe, the people in unison to Enlil in one tongue gave praise. That's out of an ancient text called in Merkar in the Lord of Arata. Here's another one. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That's Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. That's the book of Jasher, chapter 7, verse 46. Barosus of Babylon wrote of the destruction of the tower, and the gods introduced a diversity of tongues among men, who till that time had all spoken the same language. Hestios, a Greek historian, wrote that according to the olden traditions, people who escaped the deluge came to the land of Sinar in Babylonia, but were driven away from there by a diversity of tongues. One of the greatest historians of all time, Alexander Polyhistor, 1st century BC, wrote that in ancient Babylon, all men spoke the same language and, and design and, and deigned to build a lofty tower to climb up to heaven. The tower was destroyed and each tribe began to speak a different language. Now, all these traditions are really nice. But what does archaeology tell us? What is so unique about that area of the world, the Near East, that archaeologists have still, until this day, been unable to accurately explain? I'm going to tell you right now. The existence of elaborate cuneiform name syllabaries, whole texts that, that break down Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Elamite, and Amorite names and titles in such a small region of the world congested with so many different languages is absolute evidence of the suddenness of the language barrier. These syllabaries are not found anywhere else in the world. It's almost as if at a very, very fast, rapid pace, all these different cities and cultures that are congested in the Euphrates Tigris Valley couldn't communicate. So all of them are coming up with syllabaries with these massive amounts of symbols that, that, that convey thoughts and words where they can communicate with each other. It's crazy. These named syllabaries have no 
antecedents anywhere in the world. So there is still no plausible explanation for the appearance of cuneiform writing over 700 arrowhead shaped characters that all have their own meanings. Cuneiform was introduced because people could not communicate anymore. Cuneiform allows for the communication of all, uh, all over of people speaking all different language. It doesn't matter what your language is. Cuneiform is the universal English of the ancient world. It's what it was because it's only one. Uh, symbols only have one meaning, and a symbol next to another symbol only has that meaning. And then when seven symbols are put together, that it's only going to convey that one thought. Therefore, it doesn't matter what language you verbally spoke. Cuneiform was the way everybody could communicate. And the very fact that it came into existence all at the same time, or with no, almost no development, is absolute proof that something very unusual had happened. And the, and the traditional record tells us that it was, a, it was what we translate today from a technologically advanced perspective. We, we translate this as an edit. Our reality was edited, and it just happened to be at the appearance of that damn thing, the dark satellite. Every time it appears, it does this. It edits something. This time it edited languages. Next time it, it edited the, uh, how long a year is, what messed up everybody's calendars. Next time it's going to edit. How long day? How long a day and year is again? It's crazy, but real quick, what is this? Oh yeah, three hours and thirty nine minutes. I'm getting close, guys, to to my to this epic closure. I'm getting close to it, but I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. So what we're gonna do is I got that one bathroom video because I am swimming. In, you'll see me dancing in my seat. I'm swim. I'm swimming in this coffee, guys. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this, this bathroom video real quick, and I'll be right back. I'm going to have to share my screen. There is an object hidden in the sky. Our predecessors studied its appearances. Like a vast clockwork apparatus, it appeared on a fixed timeline and disappeared whole civilizations. They have left us records of this invisible eye in the sky and how they hid underground from its face. They feared the return of the phoenix. All right, guys. Didn't take me long. That, that came out something powerful. Hmm. Thank you, Watcher. I know Meryl was probably in there earlier. I thank all you guys. I haven't been paying attention to the chat because I'm in my zone. But I do appreciate you, man. All right, so let's get back into let's get back into this. Three hours and forty two minutes. That's nothing. We've done this before. All right. So where was that? Okay, so this editing, this is 1899 BC. This editing took took place, but at the same time that 
the Tower of Babel is destroyed by by a plasma blast or whatever from the sky, at the exact same time, the earthquake shoves the North African plate up in the 340th year and exposes the Sphinx, all damaged now, and the Great Pyramid, and the great both Great Pyramids are, are thrust up back up into the air. The, the whole thing was only elevated about 200 feet, but 200 feet was enough to push the Mediterranean back to where, to where its present coastline is. Imagine this, total coincidence, 108 miles away from the Great Pyramid today is where the, is where the Mediterranean coast is right now, 108 miles. So, oh, uh, this is how we make sense of some of these obscure things like tr the uh, in the Vedic tradition, Vishnu, after the flood, Vishnu recovered the holy books from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. In, in, the, in, the, in the Apocrypha, what have I shown you guys? Pyramids were referred to as books too. Second Esdras refers to the pyramid as 204 books. How many levels does it have? 203. When you get to the 203rd, there's an empty platform up there. The 204th is the chief cornerstone. It's 204 books. So, uh, and the four faces of Brahma, remember they said the four faces of Brahma were under the wa under the ocean. That's great. It's just another, it's, an, it's another allusion to the Great Pyramid. An old Hindu flood tradition is alluded to in the ode by a Hindu a poet named Javadeva. Javadeva wrote, Thou recoverest the Veda in the waters of the ocean. Yeah, Veda means altar. It is the altar. So, well, actually, Veda means knowledge, but it comes from a root means altar. So we have it's a we have a lot we have a lot of allusions to that. But you'd have to go to my Great Pyramid videos to see all those. So let's see. Mm. Oh, we're, we're we're already got to the next year. So the dark satellite is come and gone. Seven kings have come and gone. There's now the seven kings. Or, or they won't they won't be seen again until the editing of 713 BC when time is edited. So remember a lot of this this is this is technology. This is technology guys. So uh, what, whatever happened to these people was, was of technological provenance. So yeah I'm, I'm removing all the mystical. I'm removing all, all that I, I'm not I'm not buying it. Like I said we're, we're, we are reviewing stories through the filters of multiple resets. So it loses the technological veneer that it's supposed to have. So now we get to 341 years after the flood, which to us 341 years ago was 1683 BC. That's a long time ago. So here, 341 years after the flood is 1898. 1898 BC, we now have Anum of Sumer. Remember, the Sumerian was Indo-Iranian. So if you reverse Anum, you have Mina. And this is exactly what we have in the book of Jasher. Anum of Sumer goes to Egypt. This is exactly what Professor Waddell found out about uh, the, the, the Sumerian origin of the, of the very earliest Egyptian dynasties. Because Anum of Sumer is Means, the founder of Egyptian civilization. So this... Uh, uh, Anum of Sumer happens to have a son named Osiris. Osiris sounds real close to Osiris, doesn't it? So in 1898, the uh, Sumerians go and they fight this this called the Ethiopic War against the Elamites and they win. And and uh, uh, Ethiopic War is for is for control over this new region of 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 Egypt that just opened up. That's what the whole war was about. The raised land just exposed a whole bunch because at the exact same time, the whole area of northern Africa drained out and all that water went back to the Mediterranean. What did it leave behind? It's called the Sahara Desert. But what was it originally called? It was called the Triton Sea. All that area, it's mentioned by Diodor Siculus and Strabo, both of them, both of them ancient Greek geographers, and they knew that whole North Africa used to be a sea. So this is what happened. Now, 342 years after the Great Flood, one year after the Ethiopic War, 342 years after the Flood is 1897 B.C. 
Now, all of a sudden, Egypt, China, the Yangtze Valley, Egypt is the Nile Valley, Babylonia is the Tigris Euphrates, uh, Elam is the Indus Valley, uh, Anatolia, Northern Mediterranean, the Dardanelles, Black Sea, uh, Central America is the, uh, the, the civilization of Ecuador, and South America, the Urumbaba Valley. All these valley civilizations just explode with activity. Why? Because we now have the founding of the Heliolithic Maritime Empire. With the fall of with the fall of the Tower of Babel and the splintering out of cultures, now all of a sudden everybody's gone and they just move, they just leave the Near East and whole fleets go to all these places and they literally take over from the locals, the indigenous people who are who are smooth skinned, black hair, black eyed, long straight black hair and there's the same, it's almost the exact same people in the Yangtze Valley of China as found in the Indus Valley, as found in the, in the Sumerians who, who were the black-headed people who couldn't grow facial hair. It's the same olive-skinned people. They had the uh, same people of the Urim Baba Valley of South America. It's like, it's like the people of a whole nother epic that were left behind. And the Anuna, also called the Amuru, who are now who are now founding this Heliolithic maritime empire all over the world are, are using these people for their geographical location and for work. Uh, some of them might be indentured servitude, some of them are slavery, but a lot of times uh, we have nothing but traditions from South America of the South American people calling them the, the Viracocas, calling them the Votans, and Central America was the Quetzalcoatls and the Kulkukans and the, uh, the Pakals. We have all these traditions of benefactors, bearded benefactors who brought civilization and brought amenities. And uh, the main thing they really wanted from the people were reeds. And all these valley civilizations have these reeds. Thor Heyerdahl made, made ancient ships the way the ships were made, you know, 4,000 years ago out of the exact same reeds and sailed all different seas and oceans. He became famous for it, showing that you could use these reeds to make seagoing vessels that even held cargo. So it's all, oh, this is when it exploded. Two years after, after this ma massive event, we have, we have all these civilizations exploding at the same time. Well, and, and a whole bunch of, a whole bunch, uh, we're talking about Easter Island as well, all of them. So now we have 344 years after the Great Flood. 344 years from now, 1680 BC. But 344 years after the Great Flood is going to be 1895 BC. Now Nimrod, under the throne name Naram Sin, that's his new name after the Tower of Babel incident. Naram Sin begins campaigning against his neighbors, bringing them under his power because all he lost so many people in his population. So many people left. So now he goes to the nearest kingdoms like Aram, Mitanni. He goes to Syria, probably Bashan and Argob. He goes to Cyprus and he begins conquering all the local satellite nations and bringing them back under the auspice of Babylon. At the same time, the Elamite Federation under King Keto Laramor uh, garrisons both Canaan and Egypt. Egypt and Canaan are garrisoned by Keto Laramor. Keto Laramor is mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 and 15, but even more so, the Kudor, the Kudor Lagomar tablets are all about this guy. And he was the enemy of Nimrod, and Nimrod feared him for good reason. This was a giant slayer dude. This dude was over the Mohenjo Daryl Harappan Larix, so the Harappan civilization. This is ancient Elam. So uh we have everybody in this in this little in this few years here. All these leaders are now reaching out, trying to rebuild their empires after this massive depopulation that sent whole populations to other continents and everything. Fleets just went everywhere after the dark satellite appeared. So 347 years after the flood uh, is 1892 BC. It would be equal to our 16, if the flood happened in 1677 AD. So 1892 BC. Indo-Iranian practice of the law of the lots had ruling families lose out on the drawings and they were banished for 13 years. This story is told in the Mahabharata. So 
Uh, it's also told in the Greek in the Greek stories of the uh, of the drawing of the lots when Noah, right before he died, had Yapatos, Japheth, Kim, uh, Kim, Kronos, and Shem, Melchizedek. He had them draw lots to to for what parts of the world that they, that they were going going to their sons and their sons' sons would populate. So this is what happened. The law of the lots was executed at this point in time right here. And the Mahabharata is a very sad story of how an ancient elite family had lost out on the law of the lots and they were banished for 13 years. This is when the Mahabharata, the stories of the Mahabharata now cross over into Genesis history because this 13 year period is the subject matter of this Genesis history and, and what had happened. So this is 1892 BC and the chief Titan now has all his sons and their grandsons draw lots for their portions of the world. It's very interesting that these traditions talk about all this right after the dark satellite appeared and separated all these languages. It's very interesting. Next year, the ne I mean, the next, next event is 350 years after the flood. This is uh, 1890, uh, no, 1889 BC. It is um, 350th year after the flood, Noah, the Titan, dies. In Sumerian, he is known as Unapishtim. In, in Akkadian, he was Atrahasis. In ancient Greek Achaean, he was Uranos. Uh, in, uh, among the Anuna, he was called Anu. But that's what Anu is, Noah. It's the same word. So... So Noah dies after the law of the, three years after the law of the lots, Noah dies. So we get to 354, 354 years after the flood is 1885. Now, after 13 years since Elam conquered Canaan and Egypt, the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, at the edge of the Salt Sea, which is the Dead Sea, they rebel and they cease paying their annual tribute after 12 years of vassalage, in the 13th year, they rebelled. The Edomites were at this time building great cities. Their own soldiers, now conscripted laborers, did nothing about the insurgency at this time. In the Euphrates-Tigris Valley, Amar Udaak too was empire building. His seat at the new city of Babel, named in commemoration of the tower incident, oh, excuse me, named at the, uh, in commemoration of the tower incident, uh, it actually means Babylon, which is gate of God. Now, his dominion had spread from Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, Assyria, Haran, Aram, Syria, uh, Anatolia of the Hittites, and as far as Asia Minor. Now powerful, Nimrod sent messages to his former general, Keto Laramor in Elam, to submit back under his command. Keto Laramor was priorly a general under Amar Udaak before the Tower of Babel incident. But now, since the Tower of Babel had taken place and the Law of the Lots had created this massive war between two huge Aryan families, which is the subject matter of the Mahabharata, it's uh, Keto Laramor was not obeying. He, he had literally forged his own empire. He wasn't coming back. So, uh, in the east, this is Mohenjo Daro, this is Harappa. So, in the Sumerian text titled In Markar, in Markar and the Lord of Arata, Nimrod is in Markar, and Kido Laramor is the Lord of Arata, which is Harappa. Where we find in Markar appealing to the Lord of Arata to return certain objects and subject to his and submit to his authority but the lord of arata responds with a message claiming that he cannot understand what language the message is in therefore he cannot respond to it this is in an actual historical cuneiform series of tablets that's amazing so the year 360 the sumerian calendar round 60 times 60 this is 360 years after the Great Flood. In our calendar, 360 years ago was the year 1664 A.D., two years before the Great Fire of London. So this is 360 years after the Great Flood was 1879 B.C. 1879 B.C., 20 years after the dispersion, the diaspora, the fall of the Tower of Babel. 
After five full years passed after Sodom and Gomorrah rebelled against Kedo Laramor of Elam, the king of Babylon, Amar Udaak, waited no longer. He believed that Kedo Laramor's silence indicated weakness, for the king of Elam did nothing to punish the Sodomites. In this year, Nimrod assembles a truly vast host of Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Hurrians, Arameans, uh, uh, Ar hold on, Arama yeah, Aramaeans, Amorites, these are Amuru, uh, Hittites, as well as a formidable contingent of giants of Rephaim and Anakim stock. Nimrod marched his army toward Elam on his way to the most famous battle of the ancient world known as the Battle of Kurok Setra. In his host was a nephew called Tidal in Genesis 14, but we already know from ancient Hittite cuneiform text that kings were called Tudal in the Hittite records. Another king was, was Ariok, a son of Nimrod who reigned over Sumer as well as the giant Mardon a detested son of Nimrod, even despised by Semiramis, the queen. Mardon was truly gigantic. Remember, his mother was Semiramis, the tall daughter of Noah, daughter of a titaness. So uh, uh, Mardon was particu particularly bloodthirsty. He is the template by which the later Greeks remembered Mars as Mars, god of war. Uh, yeah, he's also found in records in Babylonian annals. He's often he's often called Martu. So Kedo Laramore met Nimrod's army with an inferior force of five thousand men, outnumbered by Nimrod seven to eleven. The start of the Battle of Kuruk Shet uh, Shet in the Mahabharata is the first recorded instance of a famous Bronze Age institution known as the Heroic Code. Before the terrible battle commenced, both sides watched numerous single combats between renowned warriors. The 13 years preceding the battle is mentioned about a dozen times throughout the Mahabharata. This is the subject matter of the, of the, of the Genesis chapter 14 as well. The Edomites slaughter the armies of Nimrod, and this war saw the end of several famous giants. Mardon was killed. In humiliation, Nimrod, Arioch, and Tidal are subjected to Elamite rule, and children are taken as security. Babylonia is garrisoned with Elamite troops. Kedo Laramore becomes overlord of the Euphrates Tigris Basin. Scholars have linked the Lord of Arata to Harappa. This was a, a Indus Valley takeover of the Tigris-Euphrates Basin. The Battle of Kurukshetra was about the right to the, to the resources of glue and bitumen products of Canaan around the Dead Sea, situated by Sodom and Gomorrah. It was Nimrod's intent to defeat the Elamites and then secure his dominion westward into Canaan to the cities of the plain, which were known to be very rich. This was Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> See, the three oldest and sacred Indian epics led, led up to and described the battle. The Ramayana covers Rama's, Nimrod's early life, uh, weaving in the 14-year span of banishment and loss of power mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 and 15. The Mahabharata, the longest epic poem in the world at over 100,000 verses, continues the 14-year or ordeal. The Bhagavad Gita is the song of the Lord, a long epic conversation between Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefront of Kurukshetra. Ramayana ends with Rama's return to power. And this is exactly what we're about to find. It is, it is amazing how Nimrod got the crap beat out of him. Sent back home in humiliation, his ho his own homeland completely garrisoned, and yet, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Rama is going to rise from the ashes. He is going to come back even more powerful after he was defeated. And this is how it happened. Check my chat and make sure I'm not just running my mouth. All right. Cool.
Everything's good. No complaints. So let's get to 362 years after the flood is 1877 BC. Abram leaves Haran. This is the city of the Hurrians, an Indo-Aryan people. And his kin and follows the instructions of God to go to Canaan. In Canaan, the future land of Israel, Abram's name is changed to Abraham. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, we know this is just the Jewish version. We don't have it. It's probably not even true. But his name was Abram. And uh, in Genesis, his name, is, his name is changed to Abraham. This is probably to, get, to distance himself from, from the Sanskrit and the Vedic, the Vedic traditions. So he enters a covenant with God in this year. This is 1877 BC. This is the forging of the Abrahamic covenant, which is very, very different than the, the covenant of Yahweh, which is a covenant of death. And it's introduced in a different book, Exodus. Remember, uh, the, the Yahweh, come, Yahweh, Yahweh is introduced in a desert. And this is why the Israelites didn't want, didn't want to comply at all with Moses and because it was widely known in the ancient world that deserts bred demons. De no, no good God came from a desert. The, uh, uh, deserts were deserts were evidence of a world that had been destroyed. Therefore, there were places of evil. And uh, Moses met such a deity called Yahweh, who came out of a burning bush in the, in the middle of a desert, and the Israelites bucked. And for the entire history of Israel was against Judah. The whole, the whole, the whole history of Israel until until the Israelites disappeared, until Bit Omri disappeared into Assyria. So let's see. Let's do this. Okay, we get through here. Yeah, Abraham. Abram goes into Egypt, and we find out in my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza. You can read all about it, but I also also have it on my channel in my Great Pyramid videos. You can read all. You can listen to how Abram went to Egypt and taught at the priestly colleges. He taught the Egyptians how to how to decipher the the pre flood writings, all all that stuff. It's all it's all in there. The, as a matter of fact, the Egyptians even have a papyrus that remembers Abraham. They remember him fondly as well, and they they marvel at, at his deal. Just like Genesis says that that Abram was one hundred and ten years old, living among the the. Uh, in the cities of the Philistines, the Egyptian papyrus says the same thing. A venerable old man, a foreigner, a foreigner uh, named named Philistus, who had come from who had come from uh, I think the north or the west, had come in. Who was one hundred? The, the Egyptian papyrus says he was one hundred and ten years old. The exact same thing Genesis says is found in the Egyptian papyrus, except the Egyptian papyrus names him a Philistine because that's where he came from. Genesis says he lived among the Philistines, but both Genesis and the Egyptian text say he was one hundred and ten years old and a foreigner, and he came into Egypt and he taught Pharaoh and Pharaoh's priests how to decode the secret plans with numbers and the, the writings of Thoth. This is because it was only after the appearance of the dark satellite that the Egyptians were able to even research the Great Pyramid. All right, so let's go with moving on. 367 years after the flood is 1872 B.C. In 1872 B.C., Abraham is a very powerful man by this time with an extensive house. He and his nephew Lot separate their flocks and herds too. They're too large for any one area to support them. Lot chooses to dwell in the plain of Sodom, a lush valley, and Abraham returns to Canaan after five years in Egypt. In Canaan, he finds famine, so he had gone to, oh, in Canaan, he had, he had found famine, so he had went to Egypt. Now, Abram is 75 years old and dwelling in Canaan, when Keto Laramor brings his army of Elamites into Babylonia and summons the armies of Amraphel, that's Nimrod, of Arioch, of Sumer, and Akkad, and, and Tudal of Anatolia, the Hittites. This massive host passes over into Syria and south into the land of the giants called Bashan and Argob, vanquishing the giants called the Emims. 
the Zuzums and the Zamzumums, giants living in Canaan. The Elamite Confederation then crushes the Amorites on the way towards Sodom and Gomorrah. The attack from the north left the Sodomites and Gomorrites defenseless, and their armies were routed and chased off into the lime pits bordering the Salt Sea. The invasion route was down the King's Highway, a famous road in antiquity. Sodom and Gomorrah are sacked, the women and children taken with many of the people and their herds and livestock. Among the captives was Lot, nephew of Abraham. The Elamite Confederation camps uh, that night near Damascus, clo well, I don't know if it was that night. The Elamite Confederation camps at night near Damascus, close to the famous pre-flood foundation of megalithic blocks called Baalbek. The ancient stone tablets called the Ketolaramore text confirm the Genesis account. For all the participants of the Elamite Confederation are named and the route they took invading Canaan is specifically given. This invasion was due to a rebellion that occurred 13 years earlier. Guys, this, this I just need to I just need to show you how important this is. When you have this much correlation. So we have the book of we have Genesis chapter 14 and 15 telling us basically the same thing the Vedic Mahabharata is telling us. But now we have cuneiform texts called the Keto Laramore tablets that tell us the same story, mention the same route, the same cities, and name the same kings. That's amazing. That means the Jews in Babylon, when they when they drafted the book of Genesis, had access to the Mahabharata and they had access to the Keto Laramore tablets when they were in, when they were in Babylon in the fifth century BC. That's amazing to find that much correlation. So <clears throat> Abraham discovers that his that his nephew has been abducted by the Elamites, and he summons his allies, three hundred and eighteen Anakim giants, the sons of Noah, and three Amorite chieftains. These are the Amuru. The, uh, the uh, Amorite chieftains with their forces and the combined groups uh, form an army led by Abram that falls upon the drunk and celebrating Elamite confederation outside of Damascus. The small force slays thousands, sending men panicking into the wilderness as the kings Ketelaramor, uh, Tudel, Ariok are captured and put to the sword. Nimrod, Amraphel, escapes. His own deliverance foretold to him in a prophecy the same night he dreamed that his death would come would, would come by, uh, to him by the seed of Abram. This is all. This was all part of the prophecy of an, of Anuki in in uh, 1947 BC. The death and defeat of Keto Laramore is evidenced in the thousands of years old letter from Hammurabi, where we read a demand from Hammurabi for the return of temple virgins taken priorly by Keto Laramore. This demand could never have been made had not Keto Laramore first forcibly taken them to Elam before losing power to Babylon. Sodom, Sodom and the cities of the plain are given back their possessions and people, and this begins 24 years of prosperity and isolationism. Guys, I, I got I got to tell you about this because it has everything to do with what the United States is going through right now. I need to tell you this. This is already in my chronicon. It's already in my chronicon, guys. But we have... This begins 24 years of prosperity and isolationism. The Sodomites and their Canaanite neighbors grow famously rich and their prosperity results in a degeneration into hedonism and public demonstrations of torture of foreigners and locals caught helping them. The Sodomites would take, would take iron beds and if anybody looked Taller than the average person is supposed to look, they would they would put them on the bed, and if, and if they couldn't fit on the bed from the bottom of their feet to the top of their head, they were strapped to the bed, and the bed had winches, and they would pull their body apart and kill them. It was, it was a rack. So 
uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were literally killing, uh, killing giants, killing anybody who was too, who, who was too tall and too big. So, uh, with unlimited resources from their proceeds from the from the mineral harvesting from the salt sea, they still refused to feed the poor, to 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 house visitors, to clothe anybody. They didn't give strangers any lodging. Uh, they, uh, it was illegal to give food and water to anybody trapped in the city gates. Every night when the sun went down, they closed the city gates. If if any foreigners were found in the city, they were game. They could kill them. They could torture them. They could steal all their shit. And it was the law. The law of Sodom and Gomorrah was they were allowed to do anything to anybody who didn't live there uh, that was caught in the city gate. It was absolutely the opposite of the hospitality laws that were on the books and in, in, in throughout the rest of the Near East. This is what was going on. And this started after Sodom and Gomorrah were, were rescued, after they were rescued. In the 24 years after they were rescued, they had become degenerates and uh, uh, extremely wealthy and 100% isolationists. So let's see, per piracy. All right, so when this when this took place, this deliverance, this deliverance of the West began a 24-year countdown to the absolute total destruction uh, of the West. So I don't know when our 24-year countdown, but I would say the year 2022 could have been the beginning of the West 24 year countdown, because that would be that 100%. That's going to be 2046 when Nostradamus says the whole Western world will die. So something to bear in mind, something to look into. Because remember the, the world is called Sodom in the book of Revelation and it's called Egypt. It's called Sodom for those who won't survive. It's called Egypt for those who are going to make their exodus. All right, let's see. World so also, at this time, Nimrod not only survives, but the Amuru are the new political military force that's been slowly coming in for the past 70 years. And what what uh, what happens is, is somehow they make a they, they make a deal with him and they come in full force from Mari and Mitanni and the fifth dynasty of Babylon is known as the Amorite dynasty. And the, and the king of the Amorite dynasty, his throne name is Hammurabi. This is Amraphel. It's the same name as Amraphel, but it, it's Amorite. It's, Am, it's uh, Amorabi. This is the great Hammurabi of, uh, of, of Babylonian fame, fifth dynasty of Babylon. He is absolutely empowered, even though he, he gets the shit beat out of him. He comes back because everybody else died. He's the only survivor. He starts putting his kingdom back together. But now his new military are Amorites. Who are the Amorites? They're Westerners. Who exactly are they in pedigree? They're Indo-Iranian people. That's who, that's who they are. All right. You could call them, you know, centuries before that, you could have called them Hurrians and been correct. 372 years after the Great Flood is the year 1867. It's the 31st year of Hammurabi of Babylon, and he annexes Larsa and all of southern Mesopotamia. Now, let's see. Now the, now the Amorites are in full control, and Nimrod is almost like a puppet king. He's literally like a puppet king, and the Amorites are in full control of everything. Even the scholars agree that the Amorites came in and took over the syllabaries, took over the schools, the education, the temples. Amorites came in there and just, just basically took all, all the Near East over. And, and Hammurabi, because he, he's old, he's, he, he's, of, he's of giant ancestry. He's huge. Uh, he's, he's basically left as the king. Let's see. All right, migrations. I'm, I'm just looking at my notes. So in this year, Hammurabi took on a dynastic name. That name was a was a throne name called Samu Abi. Samu Abi simply means Shem is my father. But this was a lie, 
and it was very popular to take on throne throne and dynastic names at the time in order to better look look more favorably into the the future but the truth is shim wasn't his father shim was indo-iranian we know hammurabi was something else yeah samiramis had sex with with a a eunuch uh, set, uh, servant or something, we know that Hammurabi was black. So we know that uh, Sa Samuel Abi was not true. It was a throne name just, just to basically uh, have more prestige over the very people who knew that their own patriarch was Shem, known as Melchizedek. So, all right, let's get to... A lot of kings, a lot, a lot of pharaohs too. They took dynastic names that were basically untrue. Let's see, 378 years after the flood is 1861. Abram fathers Ishmael, who is the bane to his Israelite descendants. Yeah, Bit Omri. That's the Israelites. The original name of the Israelites is Bit Omri. The Omrides. Let's see. That's 378 years after the, after the flood. Ishmael, Ishmael is born. Now, 1861 is this year. Oh, we already know. That's, that's the story of the Bible. It's all in Genesis, yeah. Abraham married to Sarah, took another wife named Hagar, who was the, who was the daughter of Pharaoh in Egypt. Let's see. Hagar uh, gives birth to, uh, yeah, Hagar was an Egyptian princess, Pharaoh's daughter. And gives birth to Ishmael. Ishmael, the son of a bond woman. That might just be propaganda. Yeah, that, that all that all that story. You gotta understand, this came through Jewish filters. Yeah, the calling Ishmael the son of a bond woman would have been propaganda back then. Yeah, Ishmael was was the son of, of Pharaoh's daughter. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Sarah is offended. She can't give. Okay, we all know this is all story from Genesis. I'm going to move on to 383 years. We're almost done. 383 years after the Great Flood. Let's see. 383 years after the Great Flood is 1856. War in Italy. The Titans have been banished to the west, the sons of Iapetos. But all of a sudden in the book of Jasher, we have Titans fighting in Italy, which is the west. And they're fighting against the Sabines. One of the main titans is named Anakus. This is Anak. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, the titans are in Italy fighting the Sabines. But in the same year of 1856 BC, 383 years after the flood, Anakus, who we know of, is Anak, son of Noah, a giant. He founds the Argive dynasty in the Peloponnesus. This is, this is, the, this is the origins of the ancient Greeks. Now, let's see. 1856 B.C. The Chittim made war against the children of Tubal in the 91st year after Abram's life. In the 91st year of Abram's life. The people of Chittim and Tubal were kin, being, being uh, Japhethites, who dwelt in ancient Italy. The Chittim took up their dwelling near the river Tiber. But the people of Tubal lived in Tuscana, known as Tuscany later. The Tubalites built a city of Sabana. These became the Sabines and were later called the Sabines, renowned for having the most beautiful daughters. The nations around would come to receive the daughters of Tubal, but after the Chittim made war against them, they refused any of the Chittim from receiving their daughters. So let's see. Usher's chronology citing Eusebius has the Argives settled in the Peloponnesus exactly 1080 years before the first Olympiad. Get that. Here's another confirmation. Anak rules on the throne of ancient Greece in the Peloponnesus 1080 years before the first Olympiad. First Olympiad is 776 BC. 1080 years on top of that is this year we're talking about 1856 BC. There we go. So we have the Anakim, the ancient Greeks. This is why in ancient Greece, the title for a ruler or an overlord was Anax, A-N-A-X. I, I, I showed you guys that in my, in my book on giants uh, out of the writings of Robert Graves in the Greek myths and the white goddess. That's an ancient Greek title, Anax, long after the giants were gone. Let's see. All right. We're moving to 384. 
384, 384 years after the Great Flood is 1855 B.C. 1855 B.C., the Nemesis X object, in its 60th year, it's been hanging around. It now leaves. It's gone. For 732 years, it will be gone. It'll stay away. Unfortunately, 1855 B.C., this is the year 2040, Annus Mundi. But it's not really a cross-clinical parallel because we have nothing recorded in this year as to anything bad happening. But this is where things get really interesting. Remember, we have all these fragments from the ancient records talking about Vimanas and talking about technologically advanced artifacts, flying machines. Oh, we have a problem here, guys. We, we're still painting this in the way the traditions do. Remember, in the Greek versions, they have powerful weapons. They have, they have these fas fasces that Martin Leakey is always talking about, and they have these labyrinths, labyrinths with their lightning bolt throwers. They have these awesome weapons. In the Mahabharata, they have star spears. And um, so in the Greek text, they, the Titans fought with these badass weapons. And like I said, we're dealing with multiple resets and the filters that are that are imposed. So I am conveying these things to you as the mythological record conveys them. But really, it's it's painting more and more of a picture of the unfolding of war using weapons of technological sophistication. So the Nemesis X object, which is always attached to appearances of, of Anuna and appearances of Anuna with technology, like it does in the in the last days in the in the in the tribulation period. Here we have uh, the Nemesis X object leaves, but just like the two sky dragons of Phoenix and the Nemesis X in the apocalypse in tribulation period 2040 and 2046, there's a six year six year difference. There's a six year period of difference. Here again, we have a six year period of difference because six years after the Nemesis X object disappears, we have the year 1849 BC. This is the year 2046 Annus Mundi. Remember, in our lifetime right now, we're looking at 2040 in 16 years. We're looking at 2040 as the return of the Phoenix phenomenon. Six years after that is the, is the return of the Nemesis X object, which begins a 60-year period of the presence of the Nemesis X object in the sky, and, it, and it, it basically heralds the entire tribulation period. Now, till till 2106 AD, the return of the chief cornerstone. So now we have, here in the ancient world, same thing, but it's in reverse. Nemesis X object is gone, and six years later, we have 1849 BC, which happens to be 2046 and Omundi, the 2046 year of the ancient world's calendar. So, cross calendrical parallel, 2046 right here being 1849. What happens in this year? First of all, it's 966 and O Pyramid. 966 is 138 times 7. That's, that's, that's really weird. This is. 390th year after the flood. It is exactly 50 years, one ancient jubilee. It is 50 years since the dark satellite confused all the languages and destroyed the pyramid in Babylon. In this year of 1849, the cities, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are completely obliterated by an object in the sky. Sumer, Akkad, Larak, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, all the Indus Valley civilization, the Sumerian cities uh, of the southern area, all the way to the Persian Gulf, and then across the Arabian Desert, all of all, all of the all four cities of the plain of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam are vaporized. One small, one small community called Bela absolutely survives, no casualties. But they're in, the, they're in the path of destruction as well. All these cities are completely destroyed. It's not just a story in the book of Genesis. We have Sumerian and Akkadian records that tell the whole story in horrific detail. They're called the Lamentation Texts. I've talked about them quite a bit. Russian, Russian scientists have been to Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa and have excavated down to the level of 1849 B.C. and have found 
skeletons, human skeletons holding hands as if they watched their doom approach. Whole crowds of people with their skeletons fused to the stone. Yeah, I've shown I've shown pictures on my channel of of Mahenjo Daro and what was found by the Russian scientists. Also, they tested it. And those skeletons, even though this happened in 1849 BC, those skeletons are 50 times more radioactive than anything that was ever found in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, this is all published by the Russians. You can find a lot of this information in David Hatcher Childress's books that cover the, the Indus Valley civilization. But he's just citing other reports and books too as well. So... Sodom and Gomorrah, the King's Highway, they're all obliterated. Cities of the Giants, they're obliterated. Whatever this was, whatever it was, it wasn't the Nemesis X object, it wasn't Phoenix, and it wasn't the Dark Satellite. All three of those chronologies are fixed, and I've, I've widely published them. Whatever this was, was six years after Nemesis X left, and it's just like the, the, the Vedic Mahabharata describes. A star spear that detonated with, with the brightness of 10,000 suns, just like the Mahabharata said. P people in cities literally stood still and their flesh and their eyes melted off their bones before their skeletons could hit the ground. This wasn't something natural. This was an attack. But this is a uh, the Lamentation text of Sumer revealed that the ruin of their own cities was connected to the destruction of the cities of the West. Uh, these texts reveal that the vast urban centers of Ur, Uruk, Nippur, Eridu, among others, were all laid waste, lying in heaps, young laying in their mother's laps, fires were ablaze, an evil wind brought the fiery destruction even further. Though southern Mesopotamia was ravaged by the same destruction as the Indus and Sodom Valley, Babylon was actually empowered again as refugees filtered in from, from untouched cities. In fact, according to Zechariah Sitchin, the world-famous Sum Sumerian writer of the, of the Earth Chronicle series, the Elamites joined the peoples of Babylonia after this. The story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is a major biblical theme. So, uh, let's see, I don't want to skip all these notes. I got too many notes. on. I got a lot of notes in Chronicon about this destruction, about the calendrics. But yeah, it's uh, a British, British researcher, David Davenport, reports that the ancient Hindi writings, not Hindu, the Hindi writings, concerned the city we know as Mahenjo Daro had 30,000 residents who were warned to leave the city before the destruction approached. This parallels the Genesis story of Lot being warned, warned about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. The exact conversation is found in the era epic, uh, the Sumerian era epic, where the people are, are warned that era has a, in, intends to come and destroy the cities. Well, yeah, this the era epic even hints at technology. Let's see. The lamentation texts, like the Iridu Lament and the Uruk Lament, are clear on three things. Resident Anunnaki suddenly warned the populations to flee the cities. The resident Anunnaki fled in haste and never returned. The cities were totally destroyed. Wow. This appears, this appears like a coordinated assault by enemies of the resident Anunnaki humans who were targeted as a threat, inheritors of Anunnaki knowledge. That's amazing, guys. I got so many notes on this, I can't possibly read them. More on, on Mohenjo Daryl, the, the level of destruction. It's crazy. How the stone was fused and all melted together. Bricks were all melted together like single walls. And get this. Get this, guys. This was the 138th year of the life of Nimrod, Amar Udaak. This was 138 years after Queen Semiramis gave birth to Nimrod. There's that number, 138 again. It's crazy. 1849 BC also parallels 1849 AD. And what, what do we mean by that? Well, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Harappan, Mahindral, Mahindral Daryl civilization, the bear, rapid burial of these civilizations and their underground libraries, 
uh, perfectly entombing libraries for future discovery when they were discovered in 1849 A.D of our calendar, because in 1849 AD is when we first started excavating Assyria and Babylon, we found whole libraries intact, full of tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets. Can't make this shit up, guys. Wonder why I'm a simulationist. Can't make this up. There's a lot more here on the destruction in different parts of the world. Oh, let's see, yeah. I'm not going to read all this. This video has gone way too far already. But yeah. Josephus in Antiquities also describes that the destruction was started by a thunderbolt. Again, this is some type of technology like the Mahabharata describes. All right. Yeah. Pre... Even Zechariah Sitchin asserts that the widespread destruction was a premeditated event. Guys, this was not the Phoenix phenomenon. This was not Nemesis X. This was not the, the uh, dark satellite. This massive destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, cities of the plain and all that, they don't, in the ancient world, didn't have anything to do with those three objects. This was something else. And 390 years is more than enough time for a civilization to go from horse horse and buggy to Hadron Collider, to have all the weapons necessary. Remember, we've been technologically advanced multiple times, guys. I'm looking through, I'm looking through all these notes. And I'm gonna tell you now, I have I've only given you guys about 30% of these notes from all these different years because I don't there's no way it would it's the video would be seven hours long. Yeah. Seven hours long. Now remember Amar Udaak, Merodak Nimrod, whatever you want to call him. Remember, he was of the race of giants. So for those, so I'm going to close this, but I'm going to tell you now, we have other traditions about him and how he died. Traditions explaining that he was a black man, uh, that he was of the race of the Titans and giants. But we, we have, uh, it's interesting that he lived for 215 years and did not die of old age. He died because he was ambushed. Let's see. Yeah, man, this, this is all interesting stuff. Man, I got a lot more. Man, this, my notes just go on and on and on. There's no way I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get to all this, guys. I'm just not. Yeah, I'm going to have to close that file. I just wanted to get to the 390th year to show you guys the cross calendrical parallels. It's, it, it, it's amazing. As a matter of fact, it's even more amazing than that. Let me explain. Let me explain. I, real, real simple. I'm going to show you real simple. 1849 minus, hold on, plus. 96, what was that? Okay. Uh, 1849 B.C., the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Sumer and Harappa. 1849 B.C. is 2046 Anno Mundi, the ancient world's calendar. 1849 B.C. starts a 1,944-year year countdown to 96 A.D. 1,944 years to 96 A.D., Every Bible, every Bible commentary will tell you what happened in 96 AD. I don't know if it's true or not, but all the Bible commentaries say the same thing. 96 AD, John on the Isle of Patmos received the revelation, which unfolded the entire apocalypse and the tribulation. Let everybody know what's going to happen. That was on nine. That was 96 AD. 96 AD. This is the story that's been passed to us. That's, that's 1,944 years after Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. But in the text that he received, it talks about the future. Our world is going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, 1,944 years after 96 AD, making this a huge isometric pattern, a palindrome. Let's see, 96 plus 1944. Can't make this shit up. 2040, 2040, the return of Typhon, the return of the Phoenix, which begins, it's the sixth seal of the apocalypse. Remember, the sixth seal of the apocalypse is six years before 2046. In the ancient world, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed six years after the Nemesis X object. Do you see how time is like a drop of water and the ripples are events that are going out? Because what I just described to you is the future, but I, I described it to you in reverse. 
guys, I'm closing this video now because now I'm hungry and my butt hurts. And this is the officially the longest video I've ever done. Longest video. Appreciate you guys for hanging out this Friday night. Please, uh, one of my moderators, somebody's asking about Chronicon. Please put that link to the new updated Chronicon, which is a single PDF download, but it's huge. Please put the link in there somewhere. If I have any moderators that stayed up with me. Oh, there's Pamela. I see Pamela. Thank you, Mr. C. I appreciate you guys. Young Lady Patriot, everybody who donated, I appreciate you. You know it's not necessary. Uh, we do put it to good use. Uh, you, you guys know that we had a little hiccup trying to get hospitalization set up and all that and trying to get a surgery set up. So we kind of got back date. We kind of backed up a little bit. We still have to do our, our raffles because the, all these books are stacking up on me. I need to get them out. So uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for posting that, guys. And this is officially my longest video. I've never done a video this long, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it will be my longest video. One of these days, I might do a longer one. But I'm going to hit that outro. It's been great this weekend, guys. Appreciate you hanging out. It's been fun. That was a whole lot to get out. A lot to get out. The past is a predicate for the future, for the collective, guys, but not for the individual. For the individual, we make our own destiny.